friend, the member for Bridgend. In, in, in terms of uh, the issue of conversion therapy, though, as he rightly said, it's two months now since the consultation into banning conversion therapy closed. It's almost three years since the government made the pledge to ban this insidious practice. Why is it taking so long? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, actually, I held the first Westminster Hall debate on this sub subject in 2015. And I have to tell the Honourable Gentleman, if it was easy, governments would have done it before. So we have taken time to analyse the results. We've had a significant response. It's important we get this right, and that's why we are analysing the significant response and bringing forward the legislation later this spring. Joe Select Committee, Caroline Noakes. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I would also like to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Bridge End, for his incredible bravery. Can my honourable friend, the minister, reassure me and indeed the whole House that legislation on conversion therapy will be introduced into this place prior to the conference that is scheduled to be held, hosted by this government in the summer? And can he let us know how preparations are going for that conference? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I can uh, give my right honourable friend uh, the commitment the government remains committed to bringing forward the legislation. Uh, it is a matter for business managers as to when the exact parliamentary slot is brought forward, uh, but a bill, committee, uh, a bill uh, team has been uh, stood up and we are progressing at pace. Dudley Crew. Mr Speaker, I, I very much understand the intentions behind the proposed bill, but can my honourable friend tell the House what evidence has come to light of unacceptable conversion therapy practices? being practised in the UK, by which I mean practices which are not already illegal, uh, but which the government thinks should be banned. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My own friend raises a, a very fair point. Uh, both the National LGBT Survey of over 100,000 LGBT people and the in-depth Collins report demonstrated that violent and harmful talking conversion practices continue to take place, and that's why we need to act. We now come to SNP spokesperson Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to add my best wishes to the honourable member for Bridge End. The Scottish Government are clear about the need to act to end conversion practices in Scotland and have established an expert advisory group to inform their approach to banning this important practice. And that group will include people with personal experience of conversion practice, representatives from LGBTI organisations, faith communities, mental health um, professionals and academics. And they'll meet for the first time tomorrow, completing their work by summer, reflecting the Scottish Government's recognition of the urgency of this issue. So given the UK Government's consultation on their their proposed ban ended on the 4th of February. Can the Minister confirm that the UK Government's approach will be taken forward on a similarly inclusive and urgent basis? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can certainly confirm that we are taking it forward on an urgent basis. Um, since I took up the role responsible for LGBT plus issues, I have engaged with a wide variety of stakeholders, and that includes those who have been victims of conversion therapy. So all of the stakeholders that she listed the Scottish Government has taken uh, uh, evidence for, I have equally uh, engaged with from an England and Wales point of view. Tom Randall, question two, sir. Minister. The Government is proud to support the Down Syndrome Bill, which was brought forward by my right honourable friend, the Member for North Somerset. Uh, the Bill aims to tackle inequalities and ensure services and support meet the unique needs of people with Down Syndrome. Mr Speaker, I very much welcome the passage of the Down Syndrome Bill through Parliament. Will the, my honourable friend, the Minister, commit to consulting with people living with Down Syndrome and other disabilities in the development of the guidance to ensure that their voices are heard? Absolutely, I will. This is essential. People with Down syndrome and other disabilities, as well as their advocates, will be involved in each phase of developing the guidance. There will be a national call for evidence and a formal consultation on the draft guidance on gov.uk available to anyone who wants to share their views. We will provide details of the call for evidence shortly. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response and the Honourable Gentleman for proposing the question. Further, what steps is the Minister taking in coordination with her counterpart in DCMS to promote the appearance on TV of her talented Down syndrome actors to ensure that programmes like Call the Midwife, one of my favourites, are not one offs and it becomes a normal life for children to see someone like them on TV and know that they can achieve their dreams too with hard work and determination? Uh, I thank the Honourable General for this question. And certainly, the passage of this bill has, been, has given a platform to many people with Down syndrome, and I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman very much enjoyed meeting actors, models, and uh, many uh, people with Down syndrome who just showed how much they can achieve during the parliamentary events, and we look forward to continuing to showcase that. 
Gentleman Minister Tawil Olutemi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I too would like to associate myself with the comment regarding the member for Bridge End. Mr Speaker, a constituent recently contacted me about her struggles with the cost of living crisis. She is the sole carer of a young daughter, and after 25 years of misdiagnosis, she has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She is already struggling to make ends meet, and now her energy bills are set to, trop- to triple. Last week's spring statement said nothing about mental health and hardly mentioned disabilities. Whereas Labour has a plan to ease cost of living and get a million more people a year mental health services. So where is the government's plan to help the millions of people like her? Um, clearly, this would normally be covered in, uh, in uh, different questions, but the, as the Mental Health Minister, we do have a plan. We have uh, a lot of investment in mental health. We have more investment going in to catch up, but we also have a mental health strategy uh, plan that we'll be working on this year, and we will very much be making sure that we address uh, people with bipolar in that class strategy. Senator Higgin. Question number three, sir. Mr Speaker, this government believes the circumstances of one's birth should not determine life outcomes. We recently published our levelling up white paper to address regional disparities across the UK and put more money in the pockets of those who need it most. We are also bolstering the Social Mobility Commission by appointing new commissioners who will help improve public understanding of how opportunity is created and made accessible for all. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer? For too long, the focus on social mobility has been on what a person looked like and not what they can offer. So can the Minister confirm at the dispatch box that we're going to consign that approach to history and instead focus on what everyday people can offer to this country and make sure they get the opportunity they deserve? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is quite right. I do agree with him. It is very much about the individual and he will be pleased to know that this government is taking a new approach to equality which goes beyond protected characteristics of the Equality Act and also looks at socio-economic and regional disparities. And he would also have noticed um, that we released our strategy for racial equality, Inclusive Britain, which is actually based on some of the principles which he's referenced. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Social mobility is a laudable aim that everyone in this House agrees with, but I was shocked this week to see Action for Children report that nearly half of children surveyed from low-income backgrounds say they worry about their families' finances. And that kind of stress will help no child do well at school and help no child succeed. We know that family finances and the ability to work is also constrained by childcare. So can she say what she's doing in her role to work across government to help family finances, particularly helping parents who need to find the cost of childcare? Uh, Mr Speaker, specifically within my role, I'm also a minister in the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, and one of the programmes that we have is Supporting Families, a flagship programme where we have recently put in uh, £300 million to support those families that need help the most. She would also have heard from other ministers across various departments what we have been doing on the cost of living, and I would refer to their statements in response to her question. Question number five, Mr Speaker, please. Minister. Mr Speaker, we have seen good progress in increasing the number of girls studying STEM subjects at school, but we know that too many women drop out of STEM careers because of caring responsibilities, and that is why we recently announced we will be starting a new scheme to help women into STEM roles after taking time out of work to care for their family, and this will help organisations recruit those who are too often overlooked because of a gap on their CV by providing employment support. Obvious labour shortages in construction. Can I encourage ministers to work with groups like Women Into Construction to encourage women to take on apprenticeships and careers in engineering and construction? Uh, my right hon. Friend can consider ministers suitably encouraged. I speak as an engineer myself who also had an, appren- uh, an apprenticeship. I know how important organisations like um, the ones she mentioned, um, Women Into Construction, are, and we will do everything we can to work with them and support women into apprenticeships and into engineering. Neil Hamber. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number six, please. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Equality Act provision including the public sector equality duty apply to local authorities and they are legally bound to implement them. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, an independent public body, is responsible for enforcing the Equality Act 2010 across the public sector, including local authorities, and the EHRC makes its own decisions on how it exercises its functions. Neil Hamber. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for that response. Women from my Kakori and Kaiba Beef constituency and across Fife have had their coffee mornings cancelled by five council officers for reasons that have not been adequately explained. Does the Minister agree with me that preventing women from lawfully organising and discussing matters of importance under the protected characteristics of sex forms part of an emerging culture of women being cancelled, uh, intimidated and silenced and is deeply harmful? And does she further agree that all public bodies, including police services and local authorities, must observe the clear definition set out by the Inner House of the Court of Session on the category of sex in the Equalities Act and that an attack on one protected characteristic should be considered an attack on all protected characteristics? Characteristics and must be robustly challenged and cease. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do agree um, with the honourable gentleman's sentiments. I don't think it is right that women should be stopped from organising on the basis of their sex. Freedom of belief and speech are vital pillars of our democratic society, and no one should be silenced for expressing their legitimately held opinions. Like any public body in this country, the honourable member's local council must have regard to its public sector equality duty in all its functions and decision making, including the case that he refers to. He may wish to pick the issue up with the Scottish Government, as they are responsible for education policy of the kind the group we're looking to discuss, but without knowing the particular details of the case, if he writes to me, I might be able to provide more information. Ria Bella. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As uh, the Minister set out, uh, local authorities have a duty to have regard to equality in all of their work, and it's local authorities who facilitate our elections. So would the Minister agree with me that uh, getting more information about who stands for election published might help us make sure that our electoral system is as fair and as open as it can be? Uh, yes, I would agree with that, and I think that local authorities do carry out um, this work of providing information to the electorate. But if there is something specific which she thinks that they could be doing more of, then in my capacity as local government minister, I'd be very happy to look into that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What urgent conversations is the minister having with British Cycling to ensure that elite fem female athletes, such as Dame Laura Kenny, a six-time Olympic medalist, and her teammates, will not lose their places and have their records broken by British Cyclists' inability to uphold Section 195 of the 2010 Equality Act and implement the agreed guidance from the Sports Council Equality Group on transgender inclusion in sport, which was published in October? Last year. Um, the Honourable Lady raises a very in, um, important point. I have not had any specific discussions with British uh, Cycling, but I am very glad that she has raised this issue with me. Um, I will pick up the matter with my colleagues in DCMS who look at sports guidance and see what we can do in order to provide clarity on the subject. But Question yeah, number eight, yeah. please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government's flagship start-up loans programme, delivered through the British Business Bank, has been instrumental in reducing uh, access to finance barriers faced by all entrepreneurs, including those faced by female and minority entrepreneurs. And since the launch of the programme, around 40 per cent of loans issued, valued at approximately £320 million, went to female entrepreneurs. Black, Asian and ethnic minority businesses have received around 20 per cent of loans issued, valued at £160 million. Ruth yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you very yeah. much, Mr Speaker. In the last year, a record 140,000 women have started their own businesses. But research shows that only 1% of venture capital funding goes to businesses led by women. Will my honourable friend agree to meet with me and the Over Being Underfunded campaign run by my constituents Sarah King and Claire Dunn to discuss how we can better use government schemes like the Seed Enterprise and Investment Scheme to address this inequality? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Seed Enterprise uh, Investment Scheme, Mr Speaker, is one of three tax-advantaged venture capital schemes which provide tax incentives to individuals who invest in companies at various stages of growth. I am very grateful to my honourable friend for giving me the opportunity to talk about the, it, how it is world-leading in its generosity. Um, and I will find out whether a minister from Bayes or the Treasury is available to meet with her and her constituents on this specific issue. We are help out. And I, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Treasury recently announced £9.1 billion of support for energy customers, including a bill rebate uh, and a council tax reduction and continuing support for the most vulnerable households. Furthermore, a doubling of the household support fund was announced in the spring statement, which again is getting help to where it is needed the most. Where are ours? Thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Liberal Democrats, can I commend the Honourable Member for Bridge End for his bravery and for being outspoken yeah, yeah, yeah. and wish him all the best. I think I am speaking on behalf of everybody. We are here to support him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, disabled charities estimate that 
More than double of disabled people could fall into poor poverty this year. One of my constituents only recently told me I stay in bed to keep warm and keep up with my energy costs. I skip meals in order to cope with my grocery cost. So will the government, will she support our Liberal Democrat call for uh, reinstating the £1,000 of universal credit upkeep and um, keep in line with... The Minister, come on, come on, far too long. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I can assure you that I already meet regularly with very many disabled people and disabled people's organisations. I'm aware of this issue and naturally the anxiety that many will feel if uh, living on a fixed income in respect of uh, uh, rising uh, costs, and that is why the government is already acting in the way that I've set out. Just in matters. Question 10, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The HMPPS staff fitness testing policy was reviewed, updated and published in 2021. An equality impact assessment was undertaken in 2021, which remains a live document and is reviewed and will be updated regularly as work in this area progresses. HMPPS staff networks, diversity and inclusion experts and trade unions were fully consulted during the policy review and contributed to the equality analysis. Justin Mathers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful for the reply from the Minister. He will be aware that there are concerns, particularly from the Prison Officers Association, that far more female officers are failing this test than male. Will he meet with the Prison Officers Association to discuss this issue? Well, Minister. I'm very grateful for my old friend. He takes a consistent interest in this point. Um, I'm happy to mention that to my uh, colleague, Honourable Member for Louth and Horncastle, but I can confirm to him, since uh, Prison uh, Officers Fitness testing resumed last July. 90% of female officers have passed at the first attempt, and none of them had failed by the third attempt. We now come to stop Fools Manera Wilson. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, Inclusive Britain is our response to the report by the Independent Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. It sets out a groundbreaking action plan to tackle negative disparities, promote unity and build a fairer Britain for all. This includes developing a new model history curriculum by 2024, working with a panel of academics and business people to promote fairness in the workplace and developing a new national framework for how the use of police powers is scrutinised at a local level. And the measures in the action plan will help to level up the country by tackling the drivers of persistent ethnic disparities in education, employment, health and criminal Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that a recent survey by Pregnant Then Screwed of 27,000 parents found that about two thirds are paying more in childcare than they are in their rent or mortgage. This is pushing many mothers out of the workforce or to, or to work fewer hours. Does she agree uh, that this needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency by this government if we want to keep women in the workforce in well paid jobs? Minister. I do agree with the Honourable Lady that childcare is a very um, important issue if we want to keep women in the workplace, and we spent over £3.5 billion in each of the past three years on our early education entitlements, and the Government continues to support families with their childcare costs. Let me do it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Down syndrome bill and fully support... Thank you. Please, will members not walk in front of other members while they're asking questions? Let me do it. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Down Syndrome Bill and fully support its passage through Parliament. How will my honourable friend ensure that, from the perspective of equality, the Bill will not have the unintended consequence of prioritising support for Down Syndrome over other genetic and chromosomal disorders, some of which, although not as well known, are thought to be just as prevail prevalent, if not more so, and no, certainly no less impactful to the families affected, for example, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome? Uh, the Government is committed to consider the overlaps and linkages of the experience of people with Down syndrome and people with other genetic conditions, such as 22Q deletion syndrome, in the development of the guidance. And the National Call for Evidence will ensure the guidance also benefits people with other genetic conditions too. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I first associate myself with the warm and supportive remarks made from all across this House towards the member for Bridge End. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, women are bearing the brunt of the Conservative cost of living crisis. At the sharp end, as the Women's Budget Group has said, they are the shock absorbers of poverty, cutting essentials for themselves so their kids don't go without. So can the Minister inform the House of what assessment her government has made of the financial impact of the Chancellor's autumn budget last year and his spring statement last week. 
Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I will tell the Honourable Lady is that the Treasury looks at all uh, impacts in the round, and that the financial statement which the Chancellor announced last, uh, last week would have had an equalities impacts assessment, no doubt, that would have taken into account all the various measures and the impact it would have had based on protected characteristics. At least dots. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In practice, it's disappointing it did not include that analysis, and the Minister does not appear aware of the impact of her government's policies on women. So I can enlighten her, put together the 2021 autumn budget and the 2022 spring statement take £28 billion from the pockets of women over the next six years. That's £1,000 for every woman in the country. So why is our government still refusing to impose a windfall tax to reduce bills for everyone and up to £600 for the households who need it, many of them run by women? Mr Speaker, I simply don't recognise the figures which the Honourable uh, Lady is putting forward. It is not right to say that we are taking money out of the pockets of women. We have put forward a spring statement and a financial package that is looking after the interests of everyone in this country, because we look after people irrespective of their sex or gender, uh, their race, and we look at uh, people based on socio-economic characteristics in particular, and those who are most vulnerable or disadvantaged. Dr Luke Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've been fighting hard to keep body image up the agenda. The advertising Standards Authority have closed their call for evidence. The Health Select Committee has started an inquiry into this, and the online harms bill has the chance to address body image. That being said, what action has my right honourable friend taken following the Women and Equality Select Committee report changing the perfect picture and inquiry into body image? Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his continued work on this important issue. As we all know, poor body image can affect lifestyle choices, physical and mental health, and is associated with lower confidence and lower aspirations. So we have been taking steps to ensure young people have the skills to keep themselves safe through our work on media literacy and understanding that the online environment is not always reflective of reality. Jill Furness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The manhoplasty and so-called virginity testing are disgraceful forms of abuse against women and girls. I was therefore pleased when the government committed earlier this year to banning them. Will the Minister update the House on when this legislation will be introduced so that women and girls are protected from these inhumane practices? Um, certainly, the Government is committed to safeguarding women and girls, which is why on 18 November 2021 we tabled an amendment to the Health and Care Bill to ban virginity testing, which passed unopposed in the House of Commons. Cheryl Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There is no doubt that our first female Prime Minister led the way by showing women that they can reach the highest office and do the job well. Yeah. What, what steps are the government taking to encourage more women to seek elected office, and will she consider a similar <coughs> accolade to the Falkland Islands and celebrate a Margaret Thatcher Day? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I personally would be very supportive of a Margaret Thatcher Day, but I think that is probably more a question for the Prime Minister than for myself. Um, but she, uh, my, my honourable friend will know that um, all parties actually do quite a lot to support women into um, elected office, and I think that that is something that we can agree all, across the House is a very important thing to continue. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. Now we start with questions to Prime Minister Gareth Davis. Yeah, Number one, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the whole House will have read the statement today from my honourable friend, the member for Bridge End, and I know uh, that the House stands uh, with you, and we will give you the support that you need to leave to live freely as yourself. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to thank Donna Ockenden and her whole team for the compassionate approach she has taken throughout this distressing review of maternity care at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital's NHS Trust. Every woman giving birth has the right to a safe birth, and my heart, therefore, goes out to the families for the distress and uh, suffering that they have endured. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, will be making an oral statement this afternoon, setting out the government's response. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Gareth James. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While our focus is rightly on Ukraine, the Prime Minister will be aware of the great concern many people have across the Baltic states. So, can he outline the role the Joint Expeditionary Force can play in countering Russian aggression and improving defensive posture for our allies? In the Baltics. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank him very much. And the, the, the Joint Expeditionary Force, or the GEF, is, a, is an increasingly important grouping of the uh, Nordic countries, the Baltic countries, uh, the Dutch, and, and ourselves who are committed to working together in an active way uh, to counter Russian. Uh, aggression and uh, to support our Ukrainian friends. And uh, we had a very successful meeting uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll have further such meetings in the course of the next few weeks. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I start by joining the Prime Minister in his remarks in relation to the Honourable Member for Bridge End? Yeah. Does the Prime Minister still think that he and the Chancellor? are tax-cutting Conservatives? Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I certainly, I certainly do, because, I, I certainly do, because uh, this, is, uh, this is the government uh, that has just introduced not only uh, the biggest cut in, in fuel duty uh, ever, uh, but the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest cut for, in tax for working people in the last Ten years, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Seventy percent of, uh, of the of the of the per population paying uh, national insurance contribution will have a substantial tax cut as a result of what uh, the Chancellor did. And if you take together, oh, yeah, well, well, they don't like it, Mr. Speaker. It's true. They always put up taxes. That's why. That's, they love it. They love putting up taxes. Uh, but if you take together what we're doing with income tax and national insurance, it's the biggest tax cut proposed by my uh, right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, for 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. Cut the nonsense yeah. and, yeah. And, 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 and treat the British people with a bit of respect. Yeah. And let me take him through this slowly. Yes. Fifth, Fifteen tax rises, the highest tax burden for 70 years. For every £6 they're taking in tax rises, they're only handing £1 back. Yes. Prime Minister, is that cutting taxes or is that raising taxes? Yes. Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I don't know where he's been for the last two years. Uh, <laughs> But even, even by the even by the standards, even by the standards of even by the yes he has uh, even, even by the standards of Captain Hindsight, Mr. Speaker, uh, to, to obliterate to obliterate the biggest pandemic uh, for the last century from his memory, to obliterate the 408 billion uh, that we've had to spend to look after people up and down the country is quite extraordinary. And this is a government that is getting on uh, with reducing the tax burden wherever we can. Uh, what we are doing, Mr Speaker, there's, there's, one, there's, one, uh, there's one measure I, I think he should be supporting, and that's the health and care levy, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to fund our NHS. That's the one uh, they oppose, Mr. Speaker. Every other, every other tax rise, they're all in favour of. Mr. Speaker, I can only hope that his police questionnaire was a bit more convincing than that. <laughs> this year, this year, this year, British people face the worst fall in living standards on record. While they are counting every penny, the Prime Minister is hitting them with higher taxes. But in 2024, when there just so happens to be a general election, they will introduce a small tax cut. That's not taking difficult decisions. It's putting the Tory re-election campaign over and above helping people pay their bills. How did he find a Chancellor as utterly cynical as he is? Prime Minister. Well, what we have, Mr Speaker, is a Chancellor who took the tough decisions to look after uh, the UK economy uh, throughout the pandemic, who protected, who protected people up and down the land uh, with £408 billion worth of support, Mr Speaker. And, and by the way, if we listen to them, if we listen to Captain... Yeah, this is the truth. If we listen to Captain Hindsight... 
we would not have come out of we would not have come out of lockdown in July last year, Mr. Speaker. We would have stayed in lockdown over Christmas and New Year, Mr. Speaker, with the result that the UK economy would not be growing in the way that it is, and so we would not be able to make the investments that we now are. And under Labour, we would have to tax more and borrow more, and they cannot be trusted, Mr. Speaker, with the economy. Here's stuff. The tough decisions. Give me a break. Yeah. We know. We know. We know. Mr Speaker, we know who those two always ask to pay. Income stealth tax, a tax on working people. Tuition fee raid, a tax on working people. National insurance hike, a tax on working people. All while oil and gas companies see unexpected bumper profits. A windfall tax would raise billions and ease the burden on working people. Mr Speaker, the former CEO of BP, Lord John Brown, says a windfall tax is justifiable. The current CEO says they have, in his words, more cash than they know what to do with. Why is the Prime Minister more interested in shielding oil and gas profits than supporting working people? Mr Speaker, it's a classic example of what Labour has got wrong uh, in their their period in office. Uh, The the, the oil and gas companies are now investing £20 billion, uh, Mr Speaker, in ensuring that we have long-term energy supplies. And uh, I remember the 1997 Labour manifesto actually said that there was no economic case for more nuclear power. We, we, are now, we, are now having to, we are now having to make good the historic mistakes of the Labour Party by investing in our long-term energy supply. That is what we are doing. Everything that they are proposing would mean deterring investment, meaning higher prices for consumers and households up and down the land being worse off. Speaker, there we have it. They are the party of excess oil and gas profits. We are the party of working people. Mr Speaker, talking, talking of parties, talking of parties, Prime Minister, he told the House no rules were broken in Downing Street during lockdown. The police have now concluded there was widespread criminality. The ministerial code says that ministers who knowingly mislead the House should resign. Why is he still here? We do, we do at least expect some consistency from uh, this, this human weather vane. It, it, was, it was only a week or so ago where he was saying that I, I shouldn't resign. He's got, he's got to make. What is, it, what is his position, Mr. Speaker? Uh, we, of course, the, of course the, 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 Met must, uh, the investigators must, must get on with their job. But in the meantime, uh, 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 let them, let, and, we, and they should. Let, in the meantime. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we are going to get on uh, with our job, and uh, what we are what we are focusing on is tackling the cost of living, uh, helping people, helping people uh, through the spike in fuel prices, the 9.1 billion uh, that the Chancellor has set out, but also, Mr. Speaker, doing the long. I've mentioned nuclear power. I've mentioned tackling our, our energy supplies, which Labour totally failed to do. What we're also doing, far more important perhaps even than that, Mr Speaker, we're tackling illiteracy and innumeracy in our schools. Uh, and I think uh, we're investing billions in tutoring, uh, Mr Speaker. That's what we're focusing on, and I think that's what the people of this country want us to focus on. Here's Starmer. Look, there are only two possible explanations. Either he's trashing the ministerial code, or he's claiming he was repeatedly lied to by his own advisers yeah. and that he didn't know what was going on in his own house and his own office. Yeah. Come off it. Yeah. He really does think that it's one rule for him yeah. and another rule for everyone else. Yeah. That he can pass off criminality in his office yeah. and ask others to follow the law. Yeah. That he can keep raising taxes and call himself a tax cutter. Yeah. 
that he can hike tax during a cost of living crisis and get credit for giving a bit back just before an election. Yeah. When is he going to stop taking the British public for fools? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this is, the, this is the Leader of the Opposition who would have kept this country in lockdown uh, and made it absolutely impossible. That, you know, he has zero consistency on, on any issue, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but one thing we know about is he would like to take us back into the EU and take us back into lockdown, uh, if he possibly could. Thanks to what this government has done, uh, we have unemployment back down to the levels it was before the pandemic, the economy bigger than it was, and we have record vacancies, Mr Speaker. The difference between them and us is, is they want to keep people Mr Speaker, they want to keep people on benefits. We want to help people into work. And that's what we're doing in record numbers. Uh, they want to raise taxes. We want to cut taxes. And that's what we're doing, uh, Mr Speaker. And we're tackling, we're tackling illiteracy. They didn't give a damn, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're getting on with making this country, making this country the best place to invest. Last time I updated the House, Mr Speaker, on the number of unicorns that we had in, of unicorns in this country. That's tech countries worth more than a billion dollars, Mr Speaker. I said we had 100. I can inform you now, Mr Speaker, that we now have 120. They don't want to hear it, but let me tell you, that's, that's more than France, that's more than Germany, that's more than Israel, it's more than France, Germany, Israel combined, Mr Speaker. That's what's happening under this government. That's what's happening because of the tough decisions we've taken. We take the tough decisions, we deliver, they play politics, Mr Speaker. Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK government's work connecting rural areas like Bracken and Radlandshire to superfast broadband is going to come a lot harder tomorrow when the Welsh government withdraws its matched funding for the scheme, forcing the costs for installation back onto homes and businesses in my constituency. <coughs> Welsh Labour's decision means that my constituents will lose out as local authorities in England continue to fund the scheme. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that broadband is critical for the growth of the rural economy? And will he double his government's efforts to connect my constituents despite Welsh Labour letting us down? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're spending 69 million uh, already uh, to support rollout of superfast broadband in Wales. And uh, I wish that the uh, Welsh government had not withdrawn its uh, broadband scheme, but we will do our best, Mr. Speaker, to make up the difference as fast as possible. Yeah. We now come to the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it's good to see the member for Bridgend uh, in the chamber this afternoon. I commend him for his statement earlier today. Mr Speaker, last night, millions of families will have been desperately trying to figure out how they will possibly afford the £700 energy price hike that will hit them this Friday. Mr Speaker, at the very same time, Tory MPs were gathering across the street for a champagne bash in the Park Plaza. We all know we all know that the Tories parted during lockdown <coughs> and now they're <laughs> Mr Fabricant, Easter is upon us. I don't need you to ruin your Easter. So let's hear uh, 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 all of you. SNP leader Ian Blackford. Uh, we can shout and scream when we're raising the Tory cost of living crisis, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Because we all know that the Tories parted during lockdown, and now they're parting through the cost of living emergency. Yeah. Last week, the Chancellor got it badly, badly wrong with the spring statement. And ever since, the Prime Minister has been busy briefing against him, saying that more needs to be done. For once, I agree with the Prime Minister. Yeah. So if the Prime Minister really believes that more needs to be done. Can he tell us exactly what he will order his Chancellor to do to help the millions of families who are facing a £700 price hike this Friday? 
Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, th- I thank him uh, very much, and uh, uh, he is. Uh, he's, I think he's in, in error in what he says about events last night. But he is, like me, a living testament to the benefits of uh, moderation uh, in all things, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, I, can assu- I can assure him. I can assure him that we are we are get, that this week, for instance, uh, to get to his point, uh, what's happening actually is that the living wage is going up again uh, by record amounts. And thanks to what the Chancellor has done, uh, we are putting £9.1 billion uh, into helping people up and down the country. Uh, and what I might respectfully suggest is actually, uh, I think the, the Scottish Nationalist Government, the, with whom, as I say, we work increasingly well, I think the thing they could focus on uh, for the long term prosperity of Scotland is the educational system. Where I'm sad to see, where I, I'm sad to see, I'm sad to see Scotland's once glorious record uh, falling behind. Ian Blackford, what a load of absolute baloney! Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is dangerously out of touch. Food banks are warning that people are having to choose their food based on whether they can afford the gas to boil it. Yep. Families are having to choose what rooms to heat or whether they can turn on the heating at all. Mm -hmm. Some in the Tory cabinet clearly believe that better weather means that they can happily sit on their hands and do nothing till next winter. They obviously don't get or don't care that in many parts of Scotland the weather will barely reach above freezing over the next week. The Chancellor thinks his £200 loan, which is forcing people into energy debt, is somehow a solution, but it clearly isn't. So before the Prime Minister and his Chancellor go off on their Easter holidays, will they at very least turn this loan into a grant and finally put some cash into people's pockets when they need it right now? Prime Minister. I, I thank him, but of course we are doing everything that we can. The, the, the 9.1 billion, the cold, the cold weather payments, and he's right to he's right to draw attention uh, to the problem, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we are we are making uh, making a huge investments in supporting uh, people right now, and uh, another billion, by the way, through the household support fund uh, to help vulnerable uh, help vulnerable families. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, when he talks about the cost of energy. In, in Scotland, how absolutely preposterous uh, that the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, should still be opposed uh, to the use of any of our uh, uh, native hydrocarbons in this country, uh, with, with, the result, with the result that we actually have to, we, we, that the uh, Europeans are importing uh, oil and gas from Putin's Russia, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's totally absurd. It's true. Just for the record, it's National Party. Let's go to Mark Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From the publication of the school's white paper, one of my most important campaigns is to secure provision of quality post-16 education within the Bolsover constituency, where there is currently none. Young people in my constituency have to travel long distances at considerable cost to access their education. Will my right honourable friend meet with me to discuss how we can right this wrong for the young people of the Bolsover constituency and give them the education that they deserve? Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, I th- thank him very much, and uh, he's a great uh, champion for Bolsover and for his uh, constituents. Uh, free subs- and subsidised travel is provided to Bolsover students uh, travelling so far to two uh, of, these, uh, of the three excellent colleges that uh, are going to be offering T-levels uh, from 2023. Uh, but I will make sure that uh, uh, he gets a meeting uh, with uh, my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, uh, to discuss further what we can do. And David. During the Second World War, my grandmother, like countless other people across our country, opened her home to evacuees, including two German Jewish boys. Over 70 years later, the British people want to shelter desperate refugees again. Two weeks ago, I was speaking to refugee families on the Ukrainian-Polish border at Medica. Some desperately wanted to come to our country. One elderly couple told me, however, they had been told that it was just too complicated. Now the government's own figures say the same. Paperwork is being put ahead of people. Mr Speaker, when wealthy businessmen from over 50 countries can come to the UK visa-free, why does the Prime Minister insist that a traumatised Ukrainian mother and child must first fill out a visa form? 
Yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, Mrs. Big, I think we had. I'm um, thank you very much, and um, he, he uh, and uh, he's right about the generosity of his country, and uh, and and he's right to draw attention to his own family's uh, generosity in, in this matter. Everybody, I think, is is pulling together. The number of people who have come forward to offer their homes is 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 incredible. Um, but I really don't think that he should. Uh, he should deprecate what the, uh, the UK is offering. We've already given 25,000 25, people have already got visas, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are processing 1,000 a day, 1,000 a day, and there is no limit. There is no upper limit to the number that we can take. And this is a country that has already been the most generous in taking uh, people from Afghanistan. The 15,000 under Operation Pitting, 104,000 applications from uh, from the Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, this is a country that is overwhelmingly generous to people coming in fear of their lives. From yes, it is, Mr. Speaker, and so and so is this government. Johnny Mercer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I don't think anybody involved in partnering operations over the last 10 or 20 years can fail to be humbled by the extraordinary courage and commitment of the Ukrainian people in defending their country, aided and abetted by the lethal aid from this country, of which they are all appreciative of this government and this Prime Minister being first out the door to deliver that. But would, would, my, would the Prime Minister agree with me that whilst others may now begin to tire, now is actually the time to double down on the aid that we give to Ukraine, that actually we might end up breaking a pretty poor Russian army and bring peace to that part of the world whilst consigning the likes of Vladimir Putin to the dustbin of history where he belongs. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that is absolutely right. I thank him very much. I thank him for his own uh, bravery in, uh, in, in going to see for himself uh, only, the, only the other day. But, uh, Mr Speaker, yes, it is right that we should double down on, on uh, military defensive support in the, in the, in the way that we are. Uh, but, and by the way, can anybody imagine a, a Labour government, eight of, whom, uh, eight of whose front bench voted to get rid of our nuclear deterrent? Can, can, can you imagine, yes, they did, can you imagine, uh, recently, can you imagine them uh, doing the same? Uh, we will go on with we will go on with that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but what we will also do, uh, and I, I hope we have the support of the opposition in this, is make sure that there is no backsliding on sanctions uh, by any of our friends and partners around the world. In fact, we need now to ratchet up the economic pressure on Vladimir Putin, and it is certainly inconceivable that any sanctions uh, could be taken off. Uh, simply because there is a ceasefire, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that would be absolutely unthinkable, in my view. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Households are experiencing soaring energy costs. We're in the middle of a global climate emergency. Against this backdrop, Norway can feed energy into our national grid at a cost of one pound thirty-six per megawatt hour. France pays 17 pence per megawatt hour. Germany, the Netherlands and Luxembourg pay nothing to feed into our group. Can the Prime Minister then explain why Scotland's renewable sector has been punished with grid connection charges of £7.36 per megawatt hour? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, Scotland's renewable sector is leading the world. And uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, all, the, the Scottish government for the Scottish government for all the, the help and support that they are giving in, in developing that incredible resource uh, in the North Sea. I think that, that there is also a role, by the way, for hydrocarbons as we transition, uh, Mr. Speaker. But what we need to do is make sure that we have a grid. We have a grid uh, that enables us to take that electricity onshore and transmit it around the country. And that is what I will be setting out in the. Uh, British energy security strategy, Mr. Speaker. That is the investment, the long-term investment that this country needs, and which and which uh, the parties opposite completely failed to address. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, following a huge resident and parish council-led campaign, the planning application for a new mega prison in my constituency was refused. But would my right honourable friend agree that with the proposals for that site being very close to where HS2 and East West Rail cross, this is a matter of fairness whereby communities already suffering at the hands of the construction of big state infrastructure should not be asked to take more? And will he instruct the Ministry of Justice not to appeal this planning decision? Minister. Uh, well, I, 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 I thank my 
honourable friend who is a, a doughty campaigner for his, uh, his constituency. He has made an important point about a planning matter, about which I do not think I should really uh, comment, but I am sure that uh, the relevant ministers will have heard him uh, loud and clear. Eric Lyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With the government losing an estimated £4 billion pound to fraud in the furlough scheme, Surely the Prime Minister should have tackled that fraud, especially when, in his own party, in North Tyneside, furlough was claimed for a p- member of party staff, even though he continued to work. Oh. Oh. Minister. Uh, if, if she's really saying, uh, Mr Speaker, that we should not have rolled out the furlough scheme uh, at the speed that we did, uh, then I think everybody in this country understands that it was a, a, a heroic thing. And I remember uh, two years ago, Mr Speaker, two, they were yammering and clamouring for us to go faster. Uh, and, and we did, Mr Speaker. We produced a fantastic team. And yes, fraudsters uh, will be hunted down. We put another £100 million into tracking down fraud uh, in this country. £23 billion a year were lost under Labour in fraud. James Sunderland. Mr Speaker, thank you. I was delighted to learn this week that 37 of the 39 state schools in Bracknell constituency are now graded good or outstanding. Will the Prime Minister join with me in thanking our fantastic teachers, staff, governors and pupils? And does he agree that the new education white paper offers a blueprint for our schools that we can all be proud of? Yes, I do, Mr Speaker. I think it's a fantastic white paper. Over two million tonnes of edible food is wasted on farms and factories every year, and funding was introduced in 2019 to cover the costs of getting food to charities to reach those in need. However, the Prime Minister will know his government have now cut that critical funding to zero. Mr Speaker, funding for food waste diversion helps support community projects like, for example, Three Hills Community Supermarket in Glasgow. So can the Prime Minister explain why he is ignoring calls from Feeding Britain, Good Food Scotland and Fair Share to continue this worthwhile initiative and instead cutting off a lifeline to those struggling with the cost of living crisis? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank you very much. Uh, I think he's referring to uh, uh, the strategy that we have for, for food waste. As far as, I, as far as I know, we continue to support it, but I will be uh, happy to update him uh, by letter. Lucy Allen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his earlier remarks concerning the Donna Ockenden report into avoidable maternity deaths and injuries at the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust? The report makes for devastating reading, the more so because women's voices were ignored. My constituent, Hayley Matthews, begged staff for a C-section throughout her 36-hour labour but was forced into a natural birth. Her son, Jack, arrived blue and floppy, and within hours of his birth, he tragically died. Will the Prime Minister join me in offering heartfelt sympathies to all the families affected, and also grateful thanks to the 1,862 women uh, who shared their experiences with the Ockenden Review to ensure that maternity care is safer, kinder, and more compassionate for the women that come after them? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend for her question. I think everybody uh, will thank the, the women concerned for uh, taking up the issue in the way that, uh, uh, that they have, and, and will extend our, our heartfelt uh, sympathies to uh, the, the victims and their, and their families and for, for what they have suffered. Uh, it is very important that uh, people get the answers that they deserve, Mr Speaker, but also uh, that we have the, the right approach uh, to uh, to this issue in, in the future, and, and that is why we are investing very substantially in uh, maternity services and also, of course, uh, very substantially in, uh, in midwives and in our NHS altogether. Thank you. Prime Minister, every day I hear from more and more of my Rotherham constituents who are struggling to put food on the table to keep their lights on, to fuel their cars. The Office for Budget Responsibility estimates the Government's measures will only offset falling living standards by a third. This is the biggest financial squeeze since the 1950s. Prime Minister, don't blame Ukraine. Don't blame Covid. This is down to your Government's policies and your political choices. 
night. Well, I, 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 I do agree that uh, people are facing uh, a very tough time at the moment, and uh, it, we, we've got to do everything that we. I don't agree with her analysis. But I think that the, the causes are certainly to do with the, the, the uh, inflationary impact of the world coming out of, of COVID and the energy price spike is, 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 is at the root of it. And, and what we are doing, uh, Mr Speaker, is to uh, help people with a universal credit, which we've lifted by £1,000, help people with uh, the living wage, uh, which is going up now by a record amount, Mr Speaker, and, and cutting taxes on, on, on working people in the way that, in the way that we are. Uh, but of course, we can't uh, do everything, uh, Mr. Speaker, right now. And uh, what we will do uh, is ensure that we have a stronger economic uh, performance and we have people in work. And the most important thing is that we have uh, people getting into work now in a way that wasn't possible, and certainly wouldn't have been possible, if we'd stuck to the, uh, the policies that were proposed uh, by, by the Labour opposition. Uh, and that's why we have a strong economy, uh, and, that's, and that is the best recipe. Better to be off benefits and into work, and that's what we're doing. Bill Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of my earliest campaigns was to reopen Stafford's Shire Hall, so I'm delighted that this iconic building is finally set to reopen this summer. So can I thank the Government for providing £1.6 million in funding to create a hub for small businesses in the Shire Hall? But can I also ask my honourable friend to help regenerate the rest of Stafford Town Centre and our high streets to help level up the West Midlands and support our local businesses? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for her fantastic work to reopen uh, Shire Hall. She's a, a, a passionate campaigner uh, for, for, Stafford, uh, for Stafford. And Stafford was awarded over £14 uh, million pounds, uh, lately, Mr Speaker, through the Future High Streets Fund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituency has one of the highest rates of child poverty in the entire country, with too many already struggling between heating and eating. The government's recent real terms social security cut will now push even more families, children, and pensioners into desperation. Does the Prime Minister agree that the biggest squeeze in household finances since records began does not come out of the blue, but is due to Conservative economics and the notion that while some right, have the sorry. pleasure of partying, the rest of us should suffer? No, Mr Speaker, we are absolutely uh, dedicated uh, to levelling up across our, our entire country and making sure uh, that we reduce poverty. And, and that's why I'm proud that there are now half a million uh, fewer kids actually in workless households, uh, 200,000 fewer kids, uh, 200,000 fewer in poverty, uh, Mr Speaker, and 1.3 million uh, fewer in absolute poverty. And, and the way we've done that, uh, that way we've done that. The way we've done that, Mr Speaker, is by helping people into work. And we're going to go further, investing in more work coaches, uh, in massively increasing our training budget so that people get the skills that they need. That's our approach, uh, Mr Speaker, helping people by getting them into work. Sir Robert Buckland. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Today's announcement by our serving United Kingdom judges of their withdrawal from the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal is now the right decision, and I support it, as does my right honourable friend. Does he agree with me that on this sad day for the people of Hong Kong, and at a time when the international rule of law is under unprecedented challenge, it is for us here in Britain to stand up for what is right, to be resolute in the face of tyranny, and to make sure that the international rules-based order is defended at every opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank my right honourable friend very much, and I, I know how uh, passionately he has campaigned on this issue uh, himself. And I, I can tell him uh, that, I, and I want to thank the judges in, in, in Hong Kong's court for everything that they've uh, been doing. But I think that they've evidently concluded that the, uh, the constraints of the uh, national security law make it impossible for them to continue uh, to serve in the way that uh, they would want. I appreciate. Uh, and I understand uh, their, uh, their decision. Uh, it is vital that we all continue uh, to make our points to the Chinese, as I did uh, in my conversation with President Xi uh, the other day, uh, about uh, freedom in Hong Kong and about the treatment, uh, the treatment of the Uyghurs. And we will continue to do that. 
Catherine West. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Gas and electric prices and bills are through the roof. The just about managing are no longer managing, exactly. coming to surgeries, queuing at food banks. Yep. Last week, the government had a golden opportunity to tackle this. Yeah. Why the devil didn't they take that opportunity to yeah. do something and relieve the pressure on our constituents? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I understand the, the pressure that people are under, uh, but, the, uh, but, the, uh, but the, best, the, the best thing we can do, rather than uh, endlessly taxing more and borrowing more, uh, is, is make sure that we support people through this tough time, which we are, but also ensure that we have a strong and growing economy in which we get people into work. So we're, so we're cutting the cost of, of energy, but we're also taking the long-term decisions, which the party opposite uh, failed to do to invest in our energy uh, for the future. Sir Roger Gale. <laughs> Mr Speaker, today's updated government figures show that of 28,300 applications submitted under the sponsorship scheme by people displaced in Putin's war, just 2,700 have been processed. Could my right honourable friend please tell the House how many to date of those people have actually arrived in the United Kingdom? Will he give his support to my noble friend Lord Harrington to cut through the Home Office red tape, simplify the application process and get people into the country? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we're processing a thousand a, a day and uh, I, I, I think that the I think that the country can, 25,000 visas have already been issued, as I just, as I just told the House, Mr. Speaker. Uh, almost 200,000 families' homes have, have opened uh, their arms to Ukrainians coming in fear of their lives, and there is no limit on the scheme, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, we can be incredibly proud of what the UK is doing. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A cornerstone of the last Conservative manifesto was a guarantee that the basic state pension would rise by either 2.5 per cent, the inflation rate or earnings growth, whichever was highest. Instead, from April, the state pension will rise by less than half of the current inflation rate. How does the Prime Minister explain this abject betrayal of some of the most vulnerable people in our communities yeah. who are squeezed by rocketing energy and food prices yeah. on the one hand and the miserliness of this government on the other. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, actually, Mr Speaker, what we've done is through the triple lock protected uh, pensioners uh, so that uh, their incomes as a result of the triple lock are £720 higher uh, than they would have been if we just uh, relied on inflation. As it is, uh, their incomes uh, continue to increase uh, with inflation. And, and they've gone up, Mr Speaker, faster and further than those who are in work. We look after elderly people, and we always will. John Barrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Monday, the Foreign Secretary agreed that we needed to expand our soft power capabilities in these uncertain times, and yet the Government is imminently about to make a funding decision that could see, may see, the closure of British Council country operations and a reduction in its international footprint. Will the Prime Minister now intervene to ensure this does not happen, given that I know he understands and appreciates the important work the Council does? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I'm very happy to meet my honourable friend uh, on, this, on this issue, and I could, but, I mean, he's campaigned on it uh, many times. Uh, but I can tell him that the, the British Council, for which I have a huge uh, regard, uh, has received a massive grant and indeed loans uh, to allow, allow them to continue uh, their activities. Matt West. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You'll forgive me if I, I, I may start, but given the Prime Minister's uh, preferences for both fancy castles and Peppa Pig. Uh, he's very welcome to come and visit uh, Zog Playland at Warwick Castle this week. <laughs> In Warwick and Leamington, as across the country, uh, cost of living crunch is really serious. Energy bills, as we've heard, looking to double by the end of this year. Yeah. Food up 10 to 15 per cent by year end. Fuel already 22 per cent up uh, year on year. It must be hard for the Prime Minister to stay in touch with financial reality, yeah. given that donors and friends pay for flights and holidays and many of his bills. And we also have, we also have a $200 million man-chancellor, a $200 million chancellor who's so out of touch, he's so out of touch, so out of touch, he's contactless. Mr Speaker, 
The public believes. You will be sitting down. So please. Uh, uh, I hope we've come to the end of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Oh. So out of touch is contactless. Mr. Speaker, the public believes the government. Shut up and be quiet. Behave yourselves. I hope that's the end of the question. I think the Prime Minister's got the gist of it, because I certainly am. Prime Minister. Uh, can, can, I, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, much as I admire his, his style, I think it would be better as a sort of a light essay in The Guardian. What we're doing, Mr Speaker, is, is tackling, the, tackling the cost of living uh, by dealing with the spike in energy prices and making sure that we take the right long-term decisions to take this country forward, which the right decisions are that party opposite completely shirked. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. And I welcome what this government is doing to help where it can with the cost of living crisis. Yeah. But in North Devon and across the South West, we have a housing crisis that needs urgent action. Will my right honourable friend meet with me to better understand the severity and complexity of our housing shortage and potential steps the government may take? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right. And, uh, uh, she's right about the, the need to provide local homes uh, for local people, and uh, we, we totally understand that. And, I'm very, uh, and, and that's why uh, we're building a record number of homes, by the way, Mr. Speaker, in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of all the difficulties that we faced. And uh, that's why we've introduced higher rates of stamp duty on second homes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, re remove the second homes discount, and we're using uh, 11.5 billion to build 100. 80,000 affordable homes across the country. It is always the Conservatives who build affordable homes. It's, it's true, and it's Labour who talk about it. Final question, Sir Rolney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last Friday, it emerged there had been an oil spill in Beverly Brook, a river which flows through Richmond Park to the Thames. Black waste oil and iridescence can now be seen along 13 kilometres of the watercourse, posing a serious threat to the fish and local wildlife. The Environment Agency are investigating, but they are understaffed and underfunded, while also battling war against water companies over sewage discharge. Will the Government commit to strengthening the powers of the Office for Environmental Protection, as the Lib Dems tried to do through the Environment Bill, so that it is able to hold the Government and other public authorities to account over environmental da damage in the same way the European Commission was able to? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, I know what's behind her question. Uh, um, Mr. Speaker, it's a desire to return to the jurisdiction of the, of the European Union. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that we use our landmark environment bill to continue to improve the quality of our rivers, and that's what we're doing. We'll just let the chamber clear before we start the statement. a statement on the Ockerden Report. This independent review was set up in 2017 in response to concerns from bereaved families about maternity at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust. Its original scope was to cover the cases of 23 families, but since it began, sadly, many more families have reported concerns. Due to this tragically high number of cases, and the importance of this work to patient safety, early conclusions were published in an initial report in December 2020. 
We accepted all of the recommendations from this first report, and the NHS is now taking them forward. Today, the second and final report has been published. This is one of the largest inquiries relating to a single service in the history of the NHS, looking at experiences of almost 1,500 families from 2000 to 2019. I'd like to update the House on the findings of this report and then turn to the actions that we are taking as a result. This report paints a tragic and harrowing picture of repeated failures in care over two decades, which led to unimaginable trauma for so many people. Rather than moments of joy and happiness, for these families, their experience of maternity care was one of tragedy and distress. And the effects of these failures were felt across families, communities and generations. The cases in this report are stark and deeply upsetting. Of 12 cases where a mother had died, the report concludes that in three quarters of those cases, the care could have been significantly improved. It also examined 44 cases of HIE, a brain injury caused by cancer or by oxygen deprivation. Two thirds of these cases featured significant and major concerns in the care provided to the mother. And the report says from almost 500 cases of stillbirth, one in four were found to have major concerns in maternity care, which if managed appropriately, might or would have resulted in a different outcome. When I met with Donna Ockerden last week, she told me about basic oversights at every level of patient care, including one case where important clinical information was kept on post-it notes, which were then swept into the bin by cleaners, with tragic consequences for a newborn baby and her family. In addition, there were repeated cases where the Trust failed to undertake serious incident investigations and where investigations did take place, they didn't follow the standards that would have been expected. These persistent failings continued as late as 2019 and multiple opportunities to address them were ignored, including by the Trust Board who were accountable for these services. Reviews from external bodies failed to identify the substandard care that was taking place, and some of the findings gave false reassurances about maternity services at the Trust. The CQC only rated maternity services inadequate for safety in 2018, which is unacceptable given the huge deficiencies in care that are outlined in this report. The report also highlights serious issues with the culture within the Trust. For instance, two-thirds of staff were surveyed and reported that they had witnessed cases of bullying, and some staff members withdrew their cooperation with the report within weeks of publication. The first report already concluded, and I quote, that there was a culture within the trust to keep caesarean rates below because they were perceived as the essence of good maternity care." End quote. And today's report adds that, and I quote again, many women thought any deviation from normality meant a caesarean section was needed, and this was then denied to them by the trust. Mr Speaker, it is right that both the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the Royal College of Midwives have said recently that they regret their campaign for so-called normal births. It is vital that across maternity services that we focus on safe and personalised care where the voice of the mother is heard throughout. The report shows a systemic failure to listen to families affected, many of whom 
who had been doggedly persistent in raising issues over several years. One mother said that she felt like a lone voice in the wind. Bereaved families told the report that they were treated in a way that lacked sensitivity and empathy, and appallingly, in some cases, the Trust blamed these mothers for the trauma that they had been through. In the words of Donna Ockerden, the Trust failed to investigate, failed to learn, and failed to improve. We entrust the NHS with our care, often when we are at our most vulnerable. In return, we expect the highest standards. I have seen with my own family the brilliant care the NHS maternity services can offer. But when those standards are not met, we must act firmly, and the failures of care and compassion that are set out in this report have absolutely no place in the NHS. To all the families that have suffered so greatly, I am sorry. The report clearly shows that you were failed by a service that was there to help you and your loved ones to bring life into this world. We will make the changes that the report says are needed at both a local and national level. Mr Speaker, I know that honourable members and those families who have suffered would want reassurances that the individuals who are responsible for these serious and repeated failures will be held to account. I'm sure that the House will understand that it is not appropriate for me to name individuals at this stage. However, I'd like to reassure honourable members that a number of people who were working at the Trust at the time of the incidents have been suspended or struck off from the professional register, and members of senior management have also been removed from their posts. There is also an active police investigation, Operation Lincoln, which is looking at around 600 cases. Given that this is a live investigation, I am sure that honourable members will recognise that I am not able to comment further on that. Today's report recognises that since the initial report was published in 2020, we have taken important steps to improve maternity care. This includes £95 million of maternity services across England to boost the maternity workforce to fund programmes for training, development and leadership. The second report makes a series of further recommendations. It contains 66 for the local trust, 15 for the wider NHS and three for me as Secretary of State. The local trust, NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care will be accepting all 84 recommendations. Earlier today, I spoke to the Chief Executive of the Trust, who was not in the post during the time the period that was examined by this report. I made it clear how seriously I take this report and the failures that were uncovered, and I reinforced that the recommendations must be acted on promptly. But as the report identifies, there are wider lessons that must also be learned and it contains a series of actions that should be considered by all trusts that provide maternity services. I have asked NHS England to write to all of these trusts, instructing them to assess themselves against these actions, and NHS England will be setting out a renewed delivery plan that reflects these recommendations. I am also taking forward the specific recommendations that Donna Ockerden has asked me to put in place. The first is the need to further expand the maternity workforce. Just a few days ago, the NHS announced a £127 million funding boost for maternity services across England. This will bolster the maternity workforce even further, and it will also fund programmes to strengthen leadership, retention and capital for neonatal maternity care. Second, we will take forward the recommendation to create a working group independent of the Maternity Transformation Programme with joint leadership from the Royal College of Midwives and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Finally, Donna Ockerden said that she endorses the proposals that I announced in January to create a special health authority to continue the maternity investigation programme that is currently run by the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch. And again, we will take her proposals forward and the SHA will start its work from April next year. 
I would like to thank Dana Okaden and her whole team for the forensic and compassionate approach that she has taken throughout this distressing inquiry. This report has given a voice at last to those families who were ignored and so grievously wronged, and it provides a valuable blueprint for safety and safe maternity care in this country for years to come. Finally, Mr Speaker, I would like to pay tribute to the families whose tireless advocacy was instrumental to this review being set up in the first place. I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been for them to come forward and to tell their stories. And this report is a testament to the courage and the fortitude that they have shown in the most harrowing of circumstances. Mr Speaker, this report is a devastating account of bedrooms that are empty, families that are bereft, and loved ones taken before their time. We will act swiftly so that no families have to go through the same pain in the future. I commend this statement to the House. Just before we start, what I would say is the quiet round of the Secretary of State is a very important step that has gone over, so I would offer the front bench six minutes. We come to Shadow Minister Farrell Clark. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement. I'm pleased to be able to respond to this statement today, not just as the Shadow Minister for Patient Safety, but as a woman and as a new mother. I would like to thank Donna Ockenden and her team for this report. Yeah, yeah. I would like to thank the families that have come forward. We would not be here today without the persistence and the resilience they have shown for over 20 years in their fight for justice. Today marks an important milestone for hundreds of families who have been seeking justice. The Oakenham report lays bare the harrowing truth of what those families had to face and why their fight for justice has been such a fierce one. Cries for help going unheard. Parents having to try and resuscitate their own children because there was no one there to help. Women and babies dying needlessly because they simply were not listened to. That women were silenced and ignored at their most vulnerable when they were relying on the NHS to keep them safe is shameful. No woman, no woman should ever have to face going into hospital to give birth and not know whether she and her baby will come out alive. These were not just one-off or isolated incidents of negligence. This was the institutional failure of a system which failed to take up the many opportunities to realise that it had a serious problem. We are where we are today because of the persistence and the resilience of those families and their refusal to give up the fight to expose those failings. And the only comfort we can offer them is that their voices have been heard and that we commit today across this House to ensure these failings are never repeated. For far too long, patient safety issues and the voices of women have been an afterthought in health, leading to the kind of crisis we saw in Shrewsbury. This needs to change. Patient safety must be a priority for both health professionals and ministers. So, Today, I welcome that the Secretary of State has committed to the local actions for learning for Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust in full and all the immediate and essential actions on the wider system. So, will the Secretary of State come to this House later on this year to update on the progress being made on these actions? The report makes clear that you cannot run a safe service without a culture of transparency and accountability. So will the Secretary of State set out how he intends to ensure an open culture within the health service, with the willingness to learn within maternity services and for future failings to be identified far more quickly? 
Underpinning issues in maternity care, as is the case across so much of our NHS, is workforce. Only 10 months ago, as a first-time mother, I experienced just how stretched to the limits maternity services are. The NHS now is losing more midwives, it's losing midwives faster than it can actually recruit them. Yep. A recent CQC survey shows that almost a quarter of women were unable to get help when they needed during labour. Hundreds of pregnant women were turned away from maternity wards last year because there were not, there were not the staff available to care for them. So can the Secretary of State tell the House what he is doing to ensure the NHS recruits the midwives it needs? and what he is doing to keep the midwives we have in post. It's only with the necessary workforce that the NHS will be able to ensure women receive the care that meets their needs and priority prioritises their safety. The security and respect that security and respect is all that the families who suffered so much at Shrewsbury want and all that the women who put their and their babies' lives in the hands of NHS want. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. We now come to the... Sorry, Secretary of State. We now come to Secretary of State. Th thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and can I thank the Honourable Lady uh, for uh, her remarks? And it's not often we get to say this in this chamber, but I agree with her wholeheartedly on, on what she just uh, shared uh, with the House. She's right to talk about this as a, as a fight for justice, and she's right to point to have these uh, brave families not come forward and been so persistent in, 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 in coming forward with what had been done to them, what had gone wrong. This inquiry may never have happened, and she's absolutely right to, uh, to, to say that, but also to talk about institutional failure uh, at this trust, and, uh, and, and the first report set that out in some detail, and today we're seeing that in, 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 in much more uh, detail. Uh, she talked rightly about uh, patient safety, and she will know that the government is, uh, has already set out plans to appoint a, a patient safety commissioner, and that, uh, uh, that particular appointment will be made soon, but we need to do much, much more on that. And that is why, with the interim report, uh, it was absolutely right to accept all the recommendations, including the uh, immediate and urgent actions that were needed. I think in that report, the interim report, there were seven of those and 27 local actions. And I can also uh, tell her and the House that the Trust has implemented all of those actions from the interim report. Uh, that was then backed by the £95 million of extra funding at the time. And then also, as I, as I said a moment ago, the re recommendations in this final report, many more recommendations, quite rightly so, uh, that they have all uh, been accepted and, and backed by at least £127 million of funding. Much of that will go to workforce. When it comes to workforce also, I think it's also worth uh, uh, saying, because she's right about the need to, to increase the size of the workforce, especially uh, in terms of midwives, that when it comes to acceptances at, at, at for student nurses and midwives, it's that the last year's acceptances, I think, were the highest in, that the country had seen in decades, but clearly there's much more to do. Come to the Chair of the Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today's report goes beyond my darkest fears. When I commissioned it as Health Secretary in 2016, I was approached by 23 families, and we hear today that over 200 babies might be alive today if uh, better care had been provided. I want to thank Donna Ockenden and her team for an incredibly thorough investigation, um, and I also want to thank the Health Secretary for his compassionate and comprehensive yeah, yeah. response to the House today. Um, Donna Ocken doesn't use the word recommendation. She talks about immediately essential actions. So, so can I ask him what is his deadline by when all those actions will be implemented? Because that is something that every expectant mother in the country desperately wants to know. Can I gently say to him that whilst I warmly welcome more midwives and more doctors, it is not consistent to do that and to vote down the amendment from the House of Lords today on the health bill, which would make sure that we never had those shortages again. And can I too finally pay tribute to Richard and Rhiannon Stanton Davis, Kayleigh and Colin Griffiths. Richard and Rhiannon came to talk to me about their daughter Kate, who died in 2009. Colin and Kayleigh's daughter Pippa died in 2016 when I was health secretary. And um, there, because of the blame culture 
and the culture of fear in the NHS. It was left to them and many other families to fight for justice. Can this be the last time that we put that burden on the shoulders of bereaved families and build a culture in the NHS which is open, transparent, accepts things go wrong, but hungry to learn from mistakes so that we never again repeat tragedies? <coughs> yes. So to state, Mr Speaker, I agree very much with my right honourable friend, and I also want to acknowledge that ultimately this report took place because of his decision uh, to ask Donna Ockerden to do this independent review, but he's right that he, in turn, did that uh, because of the, of the bravery of, of families that had come to see him, especially Rhiannon Davies and, and Richard Stanton and Kayleigh and Colin uh, Griffiths, uh, and of course there are many other uh, families. Uh, he's, he's absolutely right to say that. He's, 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 uh, in his question about the uh, immediate and essential uh, actions. With the interim report, there were seven uh, such actions. The Trust uh, has implemented all of those across the NHS. Uh, they either are fully or partially uh, implemented. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, it, with this report, uh, there are also uh, such actions uh, recommended, and they, uh, the implementation of that has already begun. Of course, we've just received the report, uh, but I have asked for a timetable by when that will all will be done, and I want to see that done as quickly as possible. And then also, uh, his, his, his point about workforce is very important, and I hope that he welcomes that for the first time the NHS has been asked to set out a, a 15 year workforce plan. Ellen Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to join my honourable colleagues across the House and start by thanking all of the families who have bravely come forward to share their experiences. Um, in particular, Kayleigh, Colin, Rhiannon, and Richard, whose persistence have led to this review. And I hope that women and babies across Shropshire and Telford and Meakin and the UK will be safer in the future as a result of their bravery. I'd also like to thank Donna Ockenden and her team for their thoroughness in reviewing so many tragic cases. I'm, I'm sure the Secretary of State will agree with me that this can never be allowed to happen again and that the deaths of these 201 babies must not be in vain. This must be a turning point for maternity services in England. Donna Ockenden has endorsed the findings of the Health and Social Care Select, Select Committee and recommended that an immediate investment of 200 to 350 million pounds an annum is required to keep women safe. So I welcome the Secretary of State's guarantees that the immediate and essential actions will be implemented, but I'd like to ask him whether he'll be able to commit the additional resources recommended by Dr. Donna Ockenden today. Thank you. So, Mr. Can I thank the honourable lady for her comments and assure her that, that, that her constituents, that those throughout Shropshire, Telford, and the Reeking, will be safer as a result of those brave families uh, coming forward and, uh, and, and this report, and indeed families uh, across, the, uh, across England. And when it comes to resources, uh, the honourable lady would have heard me talk about the 95 million that was uh, given at the time of the interim report, plus another 127 million uh, given in the last few days for maternity services, and we will keep that under review. Lucy Allen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to thank the Secretary of State for his very welcome statement today. I'd also like to thank Minister Caulfield for her work in this area, which has been excellent. I want to pay tribute to my right hon. Friend, the Member for South West Surrey, for everything he has done for patient safety. Uh, he has led the way, and I'm so grateful to him for this. Um, does my right hon. Friend believe that? what we have seen at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust is indicative of a culture where senior management were unaccountable, where, where no one felt responsible, where failings were minimised, where poor care was normalised and where women's voices were not heard. And will he do everything he can to increase accountability of senior management across the NHS so that institutional blindness, as we have seen here, can never again cause such harm to those who put their trust in the NHS? Senator yeah. State. Can I first just thank my honourable friend for uh, her approach and her role in, in, in helping to make this report happen and, and how she's worked with, with me and ministers in my department on this most important of issues. She's right to talk about the importance of, of culture, especially where it is absolutely clear from this report that the voices of women were not heard. Time and time again, they were not heard. And, and I want to reassure her that we will implement all the recommendations in this report, but even broader than that, when it comes to women's voices, uh, that will be at the heart of the upcoming women's health strategy. Barbara Keeley. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is an important day for maternity safety, and we rightly pay tribute to the families directly affected, so many of whom have given evidence to the Ockenden Review. I want to quote jo James Tickham, who lost his baby son Joshua during the Morecambe Bay maternity scandal. He said one of the most harmful experiences for the Morecambe Bay families was seeing influential people in the maternity world diminish the findings of the investigation report. I join James Tickham in saying we must not allow that to happen with this report, and I urge the Secretary of State to ensure instead that the bereaved families should be allowed a process of truth, reconciliation and healing instead of any denial of the truth of what happened. Secretary of State. I, I agree with the Honourable Lady, and she's right to raise the importance of the Morecambe Bay investigation, where I believe the report was completed in 2015, and there were 44 recommendations from that. Uh, I know that uh, some of those uh, recommendations, the 18 that were specifically for the Trust, uh, have, have all been implemented, and there were 26 for the wider NHS that are being implemented. Philip. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank my right honourable friend for both the tone and the substance of his response to this uh, devastating report today, and also to add my voice to the consensus across the House uh, that, the, that the way this is being handled uh, is, uh, is utterly vital, and we must make sure uh, that the NHS does take on board uh, uh, Donna Ockenden's recommendations. Uh, she and her team of over 90 experienced clinicians need, are properly being uh, thanked for the work they've done. They painstakingly reviewed these cases going back some 20 years, and it must have been harrowing for them, as of course it has been for all the families so tragically affected who had to relive their tragedy. In particular, I'd like to praise the courage and tenacity of Rhiannon Stanton Davis and Richard Davis. Yeah who were my constituents when they lost their baby Kate in truly awful and tragically avoidable circumstances. It was they who kept pressing for answers from Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust, and which led me to take them to see my right honourable friend, the member for Surrey South West, when he was Health Secretary, who agreed to launch this review five years ago. They are no longer my constituents, and I understand they are now keen, understandably, to focus their attention on their family having been living with this trauma since 2009. I have some questions for the Secretary, if I may. Um, does my right honourable friend uh, recognise that the Ockenden Review has raised fundamental questions for maternity services across the NHS over the culture of so-called normal birth mm. and how a focus on targets under successive governments Absolutely. rather than patient outcomes yeah can distort clinical best practice and tragically patient safety. And from his discussion with the current chief executive that he touched on his, in his remarks, is he satisfied that the current management and clinical teams at SAF have accepted the local actions for learning made by the initial Ockenden report and are committed to study and implement rapidly all further recommendations specific to this trust? And finally, what reassurance can he give to the thousand thousands of expectant mothers in Shropshire and Telford and Rekin that the maternity services there are safe and that patient safety is paramount. So stay. First, can I thank my uh, hon honourable friend for uh, the way he has also worked uh, with my uh, department and, and my uh, predecessor uh, representing his constituents in the way he has throughout this investigation. Uh, he's, he's talked about the so-called normal birth, and he's right to use the, the, the you know, to say so-called because, really, this is the only normal birth is a safe birth, and that is that is what the NHS should be working to, and that clearly did not happen in this trust, and uh, and this report has made that absolutely clear. But just as importantly, is to set out a number of recommendations, including uh, for my honourable friend's uh, local NHS trust, and and I can absolutely reassure him, including from my conversation earlier today with the current chief executive, that uh, the, uh, the recommendations from the interim report have all been implemented by his local trust, and the ones that uh, are in this report have all been accepted. Oh, well, Tammy. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, can I start by paying tribute to all the families affected and also to thank Donna Ockenden and her team for her recommendations. Mr. Speaker, more midwives are leaving the profession than joining it, and so we cannot run equally safe services across all NHS trusts without the appropriate staffing levels. And so 
I hope the Secretary of State will be able to outline in further details what the government is doing to ensure that we have safe staffing levels across all NHS trusts for, to, in order to provide care for um, pregnant women. So stay. The Honourable Lady, Mr Speaker, is right to talk about the importance of having the right workforce, certainly more, more midwives. Uh, I can tell her that, that last year uh, there were 30,185 acceptances for nursing and midwifery courses, the highest in, in a decade, and also in terms of recruitment supported by some of this extra funding I've talked about today, uh, the, the government has put in place your grants for, for students to, to, to take on courses and also, where appropriate, focus on international recruitment too. Laura Trott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This courageous report today is clear that keeping caesarean section rates artificially low contributed <coughs> to babies dying. I'm pleased that, following a recommendation from the Cross-Party Health and Social Care Committee, NHS trusts are no longer being assessed on performance for their caesarean rates. But will the Secretary of State go further? Will he ensure that we look at where caesarean section rates remain artificially low in trusts? So this dangerous, normal birth ideology is eradicated from the NHS once and for all. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, Mr Speaker, the, the answer is yes. Debbie Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, again, I, I would also like to pay a tribute to the families in what is truly a shocking uh, report. But could I ask the Secretary of State, in, in addition to the issues identified around the culture within this particular trust, um, and I'm sorry, I haven't gone into all the recommendations. Are the recommendations in terms of governance for boards? Boards have a key role in holding their executives to account. And will he, on that point, uh, be writing to boards to uh, uh, make them aware of their responsibilities about that? And could I also ask the uh, Secretary of State what the implications are for the uh, national clinical audit of the confidential inquiries into maternal and infant deaths. Thank you. So, State. Mr Speaker, in terms of the, the latter part of her question, the National Clinical Audit, if she may, I'll write to her uh, about that. On the, her important point uh, uh, about boards, uh, she is right. The, the report does, this final report does talk about uh, the importance of boards and, and properly making sure that the people on the boards are, are vetted, but also they understand their responsibilities and have the information that they need to carry out their responsibilities. And also, it's my understanding, I think in 2014 or thereabouts, the CQC also changed the rules around board members for NHS Trust, requiring them to meet a new fit and proper test. Sean Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is impossible to think about uh, these lost babies, lost lives, uh, and damaged families without getting really upset and then very, very angry. But the work I've been doing with midwives uh, and families, mums and dads, um, in, in the last six months or so, shows me that this is not just one trust. We had thousands of midwives marching on the streets. We had the pandemic where mums uh, were taken to social media feeling really marginalised and their voices not heard. Uh, but midwives are telling me they haven't wanted to speak out before because they don't want to frighten the mums and dads in their charge uh, and that's why they often feel that they're not heard themselves so uh, how how is we've so <laughs> we've got to help them because how is the nhs and the government going to reassure pregnant women and help the midwives reassure pregnant women given all of this in the news at the moment and how can we prevent other maternity services failing Mr Speaker, my honourable friend raised a very important point. There, there are hundreds of thousands of births in the NHS, you deliver through the NHS each year, and the vast, vast, vast majority of them are, are completely safe. As I found uh, for myself and many honourable members in, in this House, including my honourable friend, but what we've heard about today is when it goes wrong and goes tragically wrong, but especially when it was avoidable. That's the point, when it was avoidable. And she's right to talk about the importance of, uh, of other trusts in this. This is focused on one trust, but we know already uh, that there was a problem in Morecambe Bay. We know there's an investigation going on in East Kent at the moment as well, an independent investigation. And so this is, uh, there's action for all trusts, and that's why I think it's very important uh, that the NHS acts on the recommendations for the wider NHS, and I act on the recommendations for the my department, and we will certainly be doing that, and so will the NHS. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Secretary of State for his statement. Not one person could help but be moved 
by their count and mm -hmm. by his sincerity mm -hmm. in dealing with this horrific situation. I also want to commend all uh, involved in the Ockerden report uh, uh, for their work on this issue. Our hearts break for the little babies, the mums, the dads and the family units who have been impacted by these horrendous practices and today we remember and commend the bravery of the families of those who had the courage to speak out. Given the findings and the negative cloud that will be over uh, all of those who work in maternity services, will the Secretary of State take this opportunity to thank those maternity teams right throughout this United Kingdom who day and daily bring new life into this world in a compassionate and professional manner. I think of the wonderful services in my own constituency of Upper Ban, uh, in Craig Avon Area Hospital, and I know today they will be saddened by what they are hearing uh, in terms of this report. So I trust that you can commend them for the work that they yeah. do. I, I will warmly join the, the Honourable Lady in, in, in thanking and commending the work of maternity teams here throughout uh, the United Kingdom, what they do day in, day out, especially over the last two years uh, with the pandemic, probably making it uh, even, even harder uh, than, than, than normal. And, and I know that many of those uh, working with technology will, uh, indeed all of them, will welcome the, this report because they will want to see the very changes that are set out in this report. Jill Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd also like to thank the families for shining a spotlight on this. Um, one of my children suffered from oxygen deprivation at birth, from what I now know were failings in my care. I was lucky though on my third pregnancy. Sheer fluke, the, the GP practice I was registered with had a wonderful community midwife. She was with me through my pregnancy, she was with me at my, the, the birth of my daughter, and she took care of me afterwards. I was listened to, I was supported, and I felt safe. Whilst I thank my right honourable friend for taking on board these recommendations, would he agree with me that every woman deserves that continuity of care and that can make a profound difference in outcomes for families? They, they will have somebody by their side who understands them. They won't have to go through their medical history over and over again, often you know, missing out vital pieces. We should have loftier ambitions. Will my right honourable friend try and make it that every woman will have that opportunity to have their own midwife with them all the way? Yeah. 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 Sir, uh, yes, uh, I, I agree very much with my honourable friend, and can I thank her for, for sharing with her house her own valuable experiences? But she's right to talk about the importance of continuity of care that is part of our maternity transformation plan. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Secretary of State for the report, and it's with sadness that we have to have a report such as this in front of the House. But in doing so, uh, I want to maybe highlight a point in relation to and check that we can do something about it. Those who within the system, and there are many good people working within our NHS, uh, unfortunately, probably the majority of people are there for the right reasons. But unfortunately, due to a process or a culture of institutional blindness has been ad, ad, uh, mentioned earlier, or bullying, they cannot whistleblow, and whistleblowers are not being protected. And as a consequence, more and more of these types of reports are going to be required, not maybe to do with maternity services, but other services, because whistleblowers are being targeted and put down. Uh, I would ask that the whistleblowers be protected and given the opportunity to have their concerns understood and heard. The, the, the Honourable Gentleman, Mr Speaker, is absolutely right. And one of the reasons we are creating the special health authority that I referred to earlier is to provide that independence and also more protection for, for members of staff to come forward. And members of staff, for example, for the first time will be able to report uh, things that they're concerned about directly to the SHA and they will have the right to investigate. Pay Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Many members uh, from across the House have mentioned the incredible bravery of all of the parents who fought for their babies, particularly Rhiannon Davis. Um, Rhiannon is originally from Mid Wales, although she now lives in honourable members' constituencies across the border. But there are many women who live in Mid Wales who need to access Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital. And I am concerned that they will be hearing today's report and will be worried about their care that they might be receiving over the next few days. So, as well as implementing the Ockenden review in full. Would the Secretary of State please give 
his reassurance to those women in Wales who need to travel across the border for maternity services. Chair of State. Yes, I, I can give that uh, reassurance, and uh, I can also add that I know that Donna Ockerden, in her, uh, doing her work, she looked at uh, cases uh, from Wales uh, as well, and, and the issues she's raised with me also has been raised by our honourable friend, the member for Montgomery Shire, and I can give them both that assurance. Jim Shum. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, first of all, thank the Secretary of State for his statement and for his very obvious compassion that he has for all those involved in his, in his support of the Ockerden report. Uh, first, may I place on record, Mr Deputy Speaker, my sympathy to all of those parents who still grieve their loss and to whom no report will ever, ever soothe the pain. Uh, will the Secretary of State confirm that the report into this dreadful spate of deaths will be made available to all hospital trusts across the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, to ensure that lessons learned and the 84 recommendations of the Ockerton Report and any mechanisms of prevention can be understood and put in place UK-wide. Thank you. State. Yes, Mr Speaker, I can give the Honourable Gentleman that assurance. That it, it, indeed, uh, it, it, with the Northern Ireland Health Service, for instance, uh, we, we're more than happy in, to, to reach out and to work proactively with them in, uh, in, in improving maternity services in Northern Ireland too. Simon Bench. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank my right honourable friend for his statement and all the many members present who have contributed to the process that has led to this report. And following the remarks by my honourable friend from Brecon and Radnor, I've been working with my honourable friend, the member for Montgomeryshire, who is sadly on important constituency business and cannot be here today, um, to look at the cross-border nature of this inquiry for his constituency, mine of Clwyd South, Brecon and Radnor, and others on the Welsh borders. And will my right honourable friend reflect that there will be many concerned residents in Wales, alongside the victims outlined in this report, who need representation on this important issue? Chair of State. Yes, and uh, I can give my honourable friend uh, and my honourable friend from Montgomeryshire, who can't be with us today, uh, that, that very assurance that he seeks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend said in his statement that the CQC only rated maternity services as inadequate for safety in 2018, which is unacceptable. So, can he assure uh, that the House that the CQC inspections? are now rigorous enough that failings are picked up much earlier to prevent this type of thing happening again. Mr Speaker, what I can assure my honourable friend is that there have been a number of changes already in the CQC's uh, approach, uh, but I cannot give her the assurance that that uh, it has changed enough, because this report has just been published, and it is important to me uh, to follow through and make sure we are relevant. Uh, the uh, independent regulators are also making uh, the changes that are set out in this report. Uh, I will uh, uh, just actually to respond, uh, just remind to the question from the honourable lady opposite earlier. Uh, she was right to, to suggest an update from ministers on progress of this report, and I will make sure that happens and it picks up on this very question about the CQC as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This House is united in our heartache over the lives lost and the lives destroyed. Are the women silent, told that birthing has happened for centuries, so to shut up or that it should be some sort of movie? I am afraid that, as an MP, I have concluded that NHS bureaucracy has a systemic problem of sexism. I ask that he keeps an eye on this nationally because I remember at 36 hours in labour, having already been rushed to the operating theatre, being denied a C-section and then being rushed an hour later for a C-section only because my husband noticed that my son's heart rate had plummeted to almost non-existent. We must also prevent the unforgivable and unscientific locking out of loved ones across all health services because that compromises care and is still happening in hospitals around this country across different types of care. Yeah. Yeah. Stage. Can I thank my honourable friend for, for, for saying what she has in the way she did, but also talk about her own uh, experience. Uh, and she's absolutely right to emphasise this point that the NHS is there caring for, for everyone, regardless uh, of their gender. But when it comes to women in particular, I hope she agrees with me. This is ex precisely why the, the government is right to, to want to set out, and we will do so shortly, a very detailed, for the first time ever, a women's health strategy. Thank you. That concludes the proceedings on that statement, and we will now move uh, to the next item of business. I'll delay for a moment to allow 
members to quietly and quickly leave the chamber and those who are coming for the next item of business to find their seats. Thank you. Statement, the Lord Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today I'm publishing the root and branch review of the parole system and copies have been deposited with the Library of the House. Can I start by paying tribute to the CEO of the Parole Board for England and Wales, Martin Jones, and also the Chair, Caroline Corby, as well as all the members of staff who work so tirelessly to discharge their important responsibilities. They are dedicated and committed public servants. Madam Deputy Speaker, with your forbearance, before I go on to address uh, the detail of the statement, can I also just update the House on the uh, recent news this morning? Uh, because in light of the Parole Board's direction to release Tracy Connolly, I should inform the House that, having carefully read the decision, I have decided to apply to the Parole Board to seek their reconsideration. More generally, Madam Deputy Speaker, the role of the Parole Board in deciding on the appropriateness of release from prison of criminal offenders, including many convicted of very serious violent and sexual offences, is clearly of paramount importance to protecting the public, but also maintaining and sustaining public confidence in our justice system. It is the first duty of government to protect the public. In recent years, a number of decisions to release offenders who have committed heinous crimes has led to disquiet, concern and, regrettably, an erosion of public confidence. Take the case of John Warboys, who is serving a discretionary life sentence for rape and other sexual offences. The Parole Board's decision in January of 2018 to release him on licence caused deep concern amongst his victims and the wider public. It was subject to a successful legal challenge, after which the CPS successfully prosecuted Warboys for the attacks on four further women. There is also, of course, the case of Colin Pitchfork, and I know honourable members in this House on all sides have raised that case. Uh, Pitchfork was convicted of the rape and murder of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. In 2021, the Parole Board decided to release Pitchfork and rejected the challenge to their decision by the then Justice Secretary, my right honourable member, my right honourable friend, the member for South Swindon. I don't know whether he's in the chamber uh, today. The understandable existing public anxiety was further compounded when Pitchfork was recalled to prison just two months after release for approaching women in breach of his licence conditions. Now, I wanted to make a broader point that in these kinds of cases, but also many others which do not attract the same level of media attention uh, or public interest, the victims feel that their trauma, their raw fear, is neither recognised nor understood. Likewise, the public inevitably begin at least to feel and to question the reliability of the decision-making when serious offenders are recalled to prison for breaches of their licence or because they commit further offences on release. To give the House a sense of scale, in any one year, take 2020-2021, the Parole Board's annual report states that 27 offenders went on to be charged with a serious further offence following release directed by the Parole Board panel. In the two years before that, there were 40 uh, cases of serious further offences being charged in each of those respective years. Now, I think, in, placed in context, it's fair to say that's only a fraction of all cases, uh, but it is still over once a fortnight that an offender released goes on to commit a serious offence while subject to supervision. Now, at present, Victims who wish to challenge a decision by the Parole Board to release a prisoner have got the option of asking the Justice Secretary to apply for that decision to be reconsidered. And it's an important innovation, uh, and I have exercised it today in the harrowing case of Baby P. There have been 39 interventions since that challenge mechanism was set up two years ago. And just to give uh, honourable members a sense of how many succeed, four have led to a change in the release decision. Madam Deputy Speaker, following the review we have conducted and published today, I believe the case for reform is clear and made out. In arriving at this conclusion, it's also worth pausing to acknowledge the shift in the approach that the Parole Board has taken over time. The statutory test was established in 1991 uh, and states, and I quote, 
The parole board must not give a direction for release unless the board is satisfied that it is no longer necessary for the protection of the public that the person should be confined. It's clear from this that the overriding test focuses on public protection. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the absence of further guidance from Parliament, the way the release test has been interpreted and applied over time has shifted, moving away from Parliament's original intention. In fact, as early as 1991, in the Bradley judgment, the High Court concluded that the role of the Board is to carry out, and again I quote, a balancing exercise between the legitimate conflicting interests of both prisoner and public. So, to summarise, the statutory test has morphed over time from a strict public protection test to a balancing exercise between the responsibility of the state to protect the public on the one hand and the rights of the prisoner on the other. Now, whatever the rights and wrongs of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, it was palpably not the original intention of Parliament. Yeah. I want to be very clear about this. I make no criticism of the courts. They've sought to apply a generic statutory test without more prescriptive guidance from, the, from this House, indeed from Parliament. Nor am I criticising members of the Parole Board, as I hope I've made clear. And I think it is worth also saying that, contrary to public perception, it will often be fiendishly difficult to come to a reliable assessment as to the risk of offenders many years after their original crimes. And while psychiatric assessments and social science can offer some guidance, risk assessments in these kinds of cases are inherently uncertain and inherently imprecise. And I think we need to be more honest and open about that in our public debate. In any case, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe the focus in this critical decision-making has become adrift from its original moorings. So this government will anchor parole board decision-making back to the cardinal principle of public protection. When it comes to assessing the risk to victims and public safety, we will introduce a precautionary principle to reinforce public confidence in the system. And in cases which involve those who have committed the most serious crimes, we will introduce a ministerial check on release decisions exercised by the Secretary of State for Justice. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the package of reforms published today will strengthen the focus on public protection at every stage. First, we will revise the statutory test for release. We will replace the current approach, which balances the rights of dangerous offenders against public safety, with an overriding focus on public protection, providing in primary legislation further detailed criteria for the application of the statutory test. Second, we will make sure the Parole Board is better equipped to make credible and realistic assessments of risk. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is striking that, as of last year, only 5 per cent of all Parole Board panel members come from a law enforcement background. Now, again, I make no criticism of the existing uh, panel members, uh, but I do point to what I believe is a, a significant deficit. I believe it is wrong and that our reforms will ensure that those who we charge with making finely balanced assessments of future risk have greater first-hand operational experience of protecting the public from serious offenders. So we will change this imbalance by mandating the Parole Board to recruit more members with operational law enforcement experience and the Ministry of Justice will run a recruitment campaign to bolster their numbers. Critically, in parole board cases involving the top-tier cohort of serious violent and sexual offenders, we will require by law that at least one of the three panel members has a law enforcement background. Madam Deputy Speaker, this brings me to the third key reform. For a top-tier cohort of high-risk offenders who have committed the most serious offences, we will introduce ministerial oversight over parole board decisions to release those offenders back into the community. Based on our assessment of, dangerous, uh, based on our assessment of the dangerousness of the offender, the risk of serious, serious further offending and public confidence, this top tier of offenders will compromise those serving sentences for murder, rape, terrorism and causing or allowing the death of a child. In those cases, we will make two specific changes. The Parole Board will be able to refer a case to the Secretary of State for Justice if they assess that they cannot confidently conclude whether or not, on the evidence that they've got, that the statutory test for release has been met or not. In addition to this, Mr Speaker, 
we will introduce ministerial oversight over any decision to release any offender in the top tier cohort of serious offenders. So under our reforms and in that top tier of cases, the Justice Secretary will have the power to refuse release subject to judicial challenge on very clearly prescribed grounds in the upper tribunal. I believe this is warranted as an extra check, an extra safeguard to protect the public. I have not yet ruled out entirely an alternative model which could establish a three-person panel chaired by the Justice Secretary with the same power to refuse release subject to judicial review in the normal way. We will consider further detail of the mechanism to strike the most effective balance. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are making these reforms because the concept of risk is notoriously difficult to assess in these kinds of cases. We are doing it because the public expect their safety to be the overriding consideration and because ultimately it involves a judgment call about public protection and the public expect ministers to take responsibility for their safety. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me be equally clear. I do not believe there is no such thing as a risk-free society. We can't guarantee that no one released from prison will go on to commit a serious crime. Let's be very clear about that as we have a more honest debate about the assessment of risk. Nevertheless, I believe that these measures are necessary to reinforce public safety and public confidence, and we will legislate for them as soon as possible. I should also say that we will do so alongside our proposed Bill of Rights to ensure that the will of Parliament and that focus on public protection is not undermined by the Human Rights Act. And indeed, our reforms to parole yet again highlight the compelling case for a Bill of Rights. Madam Deputy Speaker, our fourth reform will increase victim participation in parole hearings, thereby delivering on this Government's manifesto commitment. Now, I recognise that parole decisions will be immensely and acutely traumatic moments for many victims as they are forced to remember to go through to revisit the ordeal and the suffering that they have already uh, uh, suffered and, and been through. Some will not wish to be involved. Others will want their voices to be heard, and I believe that they should have that right. So we will give victims the right to attend a parole hearing in full for the first time, should they wish to do so. In addition, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will require the Board to take into account submissions made by victims and to allow victims to ask questions through those submissions. The voice of victims will be at the centre of the, uh, of the process, not just some lingering afterthought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, although separate from parole decision-making, similar considerations of risk and public concern have arisen in the context of decisions to transfer prisoners to prisons uh, in open conditions. That is why, in December 2021, I changed the process to introduce a ministerial check on such decisions, guided by similar principles to those that I have already set out. That is what led to my decision this month to reject the Parole Board's recommendation to move Stephen Ling, who raped and killed a woman, to open a prison. I declined the move in the interest of public protection and public confidence. In sum, Madam Deputy Speaker, our reforms will ensure that those offenders who present the highest risk to public safety are reviewed more rigorously with additional ministerial oversight. Protecting the public is the Government's top priority. The proposals in this review will reinforce public safety, and I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Steve Reid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for advanced sights of his statement earlier today. And it, it is hugely timely, given the disturbing news about the potential release of Baby P's killer, and I fully support the Secretary of State in seeking a review, uh, a review of that. In, in broad terms, I welcome his statement too. Um, it's crucial that public protection is paramount and that victims are right at the heart of the criminal justice system. Currently, too many victims feel their views are not taken sufficiently into account, either in parole decisions or in sentencing, and this leads directly to public safety concerns that must be taken more seriously. Labour will put public safety at the core of our contract with the British people. Sadly, the same can't be said of this government. It's less than two months now since the convicted sex abuser Paul Robson walked out of a low-category open prison in Lincolnshire. 
After he escaped, the public were warned that Robson was a serious danger to women and children. He clearly should never have been in a low security prison in the first place. The parole board made that recommendation, but it was the Secretary of State who approved it. He or his predecessors already had the necessary powers, they just didn't use them. So what will stop him from making serious mistakes like that again when he exercises his new check and oversight powers in potentially hundreds more cases? Labour wants victims to have a right to make a new personal statement saying how they would feel if the prisoner is released. We would like any assessment of the risk to the public to include the risk of re-traumatising their victim and prevent released prisoners from living near their victim if that's against the victim's wishes. So will the Secretary of State consider those additional proposals? The appalling decision to release the multiple rapist John Warboys was only stopped after the Centre for Women's Rights sued the government using rights established by the last Labour government. Sir Peter Gross's review made sensible proposals to improve these rights, including the UK's margin of appreciation over interpretations we would all object to, but the Secretary of State would be throwing the baby out with the bathwater if he were to use that concern as an excuse to take away British rights that protect British people from dangerous criminals, as they did in that case. Too many victims of crime don't get a say over what happens to criminals because those criminals are never prosecuted in the first place. That's because this government has cut 21,000 police officers and still hasn't replaced them, despite imposing the highest rates of personal taxation for 70 years. That's 21,000 people with law enforcement experience that his party sacked, who he might now approach to sit on parole boards, as he suggests. Now, he spoke uh, about rape cases. Uh, in his statement, but only one and a half percent of reported rapes ever make it to court at all. Those that do now take over a thousand days on average before the trial starts, the longest delays in British legal history. I wonder what message he thinks this sends about public safety and public protection. Under this government, prosecution rates for crimes including burglary, robbery, car crime and fraud are so low they have effectively been decriminalised. There are so few police left that victims are told to fill in a form online and hardly any of them ever hear anything again. It's no wonder that the government stands accused of going soft on these crimes. Does he recognise that letting criminals get away with crime damages public safety and erodes confidence in the justice system, something he's telling us this afternoon that he wants to strengthen? The Victims Commissioner has called on the government to establish a new victim's right to review. This would give victims the power to challenge decisions by the police and the Crown Prosecution Service not to prosecute or to drop prosecutions. The Secretary of State didn't mention that uh, in his statement today, so I wonder could he tell us whether he intends to in introduce proposals along those lines in future. Public protection requires victims to be active participants throughout the criminal justice process, including in parole decisions. Their insights strengthen public safety and strengthen public confidence in the system. Today's statement is a step forwards, and it recognises some of the government's mistakes, but it's a step that could have been bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Secretary of State. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I start by thanking the Honourable Gentleman for his support for the decision taken today in the Tracy Connolly case? Uh, and also, I, I think he has uh, uh, wholesale backed the reforms that I set out in my statement, and I think that is important, and I want to welcome what I hope will therefore be uh, cross-party support when we come to legislate for it. He can't support the aims and then not will the means, and I, I hope that, that that becomes clear uh, uh, um, as we take the proposals through the House. Can I um, also say, he asked about um, uh, absconds, uh, and of course that is an issue of significant concern. Um, I should uh, say to him that um, in the, the, the period between 2009-2010, uh, uh, and today, the level of absconds from prisons has fallen to a third of the level it was under the last Labour government. He might want to think a little bit about that um, before he uh, makes assertions that are unfounded. He also asked, though, in fairness, about the Shane Farrington case. 
He absconded on the 24th of March, um, but was recaptured, rearrested on the 26th of March. He um, is ineligible for a return to open conditions for two years. Um, he made the point about um, uh, it being something we were empowered to do, actually took place in October, uh, and I changed the rules in December, as I've made clear uh, to the House. Can I welcome what he said about the role of victims? Um, I think we are making important changes uh, today. I welcome his support for it. Uh, I, I would just gently point out that even before the spending review, the level of victims' funding is three times the level than it was under the last Labour government. So again, he talks about victims. Uh, our record is infinitely better, uh, uh, but we are restless to do far more. Uh, more generally, um, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, of course, the, the history of the matter of the reform we are undertaking today uh, is something that took place under their uh, watch um, because uh, it was in 2008 that Labour gave up the power to block the release of prisoners sentenced to more than 15 years and then uh, legislated to make those changes which were forced on the government, in fairness, by the Human Rights Act, but they legislated to make those uh, changes uh, permanent. As a result, it was then that the number of those recalled on life licence skyrocketed by almost uh, sevenfold. So uh, I think the Honourable Gentleman should have a little bit more humility about where this problem came from. And he criticised our approach to the Bill of Rights, but it is clear that we cannot pursue these reforms and reverse the uh, challenges that were made under the Human Rights Act without our Bill of Rights. So again, the question for the Labour Party is going to be, do they just will the ends or are they willing to back the means? Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, last month I, I picked up a copy of my uh, Daily Mirror, as I do, um, and, and was reading through it. And I, I read that the Honourable Gentleman said that under the last Labour leader, the, Honourable, the Honourable, Right Honourable Gentleman for Islington North, uh, Labour cared or appeared to care more about criminals than victims. And I think that is uh, a measure of greater humility. But I think the Honourable Gentleman should take a bit of responsibility for his record, because he and the Shadow Cabinet voted against extra funding for more police officers. They voted against the tougher sentences. They voted against the tougher sentences in the Police Court Sentencing and Crime Bill for dangerous offenders. They voted against that. That's the kind of thing that would protect victims and protect the public. I am glad, I am glad that he is at least on this issue uh, showing that he is willing to support measures that will stand up for victims and will protect the public. But the proof of the pudding will be where they vote when all of these measures come before the House. Dr Julian Lewis. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an excellent statement and my right honourable friend is, is clearly revelling in an area where he has a great deal of expertise. One aspect that I didn't hear mention of was the concept of punishment. Some offences, and particularly the sort we're dealing with here, are absolutely heinous. And it baffles the public as to why, for example, uh, someone who led a home invasion in the New Forest, which resulted in the burning alive of an entire family, but not uh, until after the woman had been repeatedly raped, uh, should be considered for release at the end of what is admittedly a long sentence. Um, most people would feel that people forfeit their right to liberty when they commit offences of that gravity. Where does punishment fit into all this? Can I thank my honourable friend? I totally understand the point he makes. Now, in, in truth, parole is about risk um, and, and rightly, I think, about uh, public protection because the, either the tariff or the overall sentence should deal with the element of punishment rather than parole. So I think he makes an important point. He will know uh, that whether it was uh, Harper's Law, uh, Tony's Law, or the wider reforms to sentencing we made in the PCSC Bill, we have uh, strengthened uh, sentencing uh, in the teeth of opposition from the honourable members opposite. Um, but I think, in fairness, I do need to draw a distinction for these reforms that they're really about uh, public protection. I think the amorphous concept of risk in these in these cases, um, uh, and uh, but that itself, I believe, also goes to the issue of public confidence which, uh, in relation to the tariff and the punishment element, he, he, he mentions. So I think they're both important, but with parole, we are focusing on risk, 
Um, and I say that because I want to be very clear. We're not adding another uh, uh, sentence on top of a sentence. The question is, from the point at which uh, an offender becomes eligible for parole, do they satisfy the statutory criteria? Is it safe to release them? Uh, or do they pre present an ongoing risk to public protection? That is the core focus of our reforms today. But I heed the honourable gentleman, the my honourable friend's uh, wider point. Steve McKay. Thank you. Can I thank the Secretary of State for his statement and say I, I welcome the broad thrust of his recommendations. I notice that the second reform deals with the question of assessing risk and the Secretary of State's proposal is to employ more people with a, a law and order background, which I am quite happy to accept. But I also noticed that the Justice Report in January of this year recommended enhancing the Pro Parole Board's programme of training to include, among other things, critical analysis of offending behaviour programmes and risk management tools. Does he have any plans to take that on board as well? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his very constructive and uh, reasonable um, uh, question. Uh, look, we, we'll look at everything on training. And the truth is, the uh, members of the Parole Board come with vast uh, depth of experience. My question is whether we've got the range right. And I think psychiatrists, psychologists have a critically important role to play. Judges and lawyers inform the process. But if we're, uh, if we're saying that our overriding focus is public protection, and we've got finely balanced questions of risk in relation to people who have committed the so-called index offence many years before, I would have thought, particularly for that top-tier case, the public want to know that, for example, the grizzled police officer that has seen these cases before, that knows the pattern of behaviour, is also there, perhaps to provide that element or that dimension of critical thinking. So I think he's right about what he says about critical thinking. We need to make sure that the, the parole board panels, particularly on those serious high uh, top-tier cohort, have that broad diversity uh, of experience so that we can take a precautionary approach and protect the public. Siobhan Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend um, for his statement, and I continue to be impressed by how he and the Ministry of Justice are gripping so many complex justice matters all at once. But this is about public safety, but also the perception of public safety, and the public rightly care about law and order. And I hear what strong words from the front bench opposite, but I think we can see by the lack of turnout from Labour MPs that they prefer to politic on this rather than do the hard graft of scrutiny. And on scrutiny, I really welcome uh, my right honourable friend putting victims at the, at the heart of the parole board decisions and allowing them input. Can you say a little bit more about how the parole board uh, is, has taken to those proposals and how we can, we can also support victims as they're going through that process? Because some of them will find even those steps uh, distressing, even if they want to do it. Yes, Lord thank, Chancellor. thank my honourable friend for her tenacity on these issues. Uh, and she makes the same point my honourable friend uh, did uh, about public confidence. And there's no escaping this, uh, particularly if you think of the history of uh, honourable members think of the history of how parole and licence conditions and how we ended up with life terms after the abolition of the death penalty. Uh, the public need to have confidence that uh, sentences match the crime and that their safety is the paramount. Uh, importance. Um, she asked about how we will help victims through that process, which is critically important because it must be gruelling, it must be traumatic. Um, and I know from the consideration that I've had and the evidence I've seen uh, uh, how difficult that will be. Um, we've already made some improvements in the process for victims. We, in 2018, introduced written decision summaries to improve transparency for victims. Uh, in 2019, we introduced the reconsideration mechanism, which I exercise today. In 2021, we announced our intention to enable public hearings and that victims would be able to attend those hearings as, as, as observers. We are saying that we're now giving them a much fuller role, as I explained in my uh, statement. Uh, and uh, on top of that, of course, um, the statutory release test, and when the Pro Bowl considers it, they will take a very clear account of the submissions uh, of uh, victims, but also victims will be able to ask questions through those submissions. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, uh, um, 
thank the uh, Lord Chancellor for that. I'm very encouraged by the steps that the Honourable Gentleman, Right Honourable Gentleman, has introduced today. Um, and what one victim, to address what one victim said to me, was a reprehensible parole system. That lady contacted me after the murder of her son was released and she saw him in the local Tesco's. She received no warning that he had been released early. Uh, so can the, the Lord Chancellor confirm that this legislation also contains a legal obligation for victims and their close family to be informed? And will the Lord Chancellor be in touch with the Minister at the Northern Ireland Assembly to discuss proposed legislation that he's referred to to be brought here that can also be introduced to Northern Ireland? Thank you. Can I thank, uh, oh, the, honourable, can I thank the honourable gentleman? The uh, Root and Branch Review will set out all of the victims' rights in the process. He'll be able to see that. Uh, copies are now available in the House. Uh, of course, we respect the devolved settlements on this, but we're always willing to engage uh, with the devolved administrations uh, around cross-cutting and common issues of commons concern. Rob Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the public will rightly expect that their protection <laughs> is the overriding concern when serious offenders are assessed, either for release via the parole board or indeed transfer to an open prison, um, a subject on which my right honourable friend touched. And I know from my own time as non-executive director at, at HMPPS that open prisons can be an extremely important part of an offender's rehabilitation, especially at the end of a very, very long sentence. We've seen recent cases where the current test has clearly not worked effectively. So does my right honourable friend agree that time in an open prison should always be regarded as a privilege, certainly never an automatic right? And can he confirm that the measures he's already introduced and is going on to introduce further today will result in a more cautious approach that will make sure the public is always safe? Well, Chancellor. Uh, can I thank my honourable friend? I, I, I agree with everything he said. Um, and I don't think there's a trade-off. In fact, I think the two things go together. We want to protect the public, but also identifying those who can be released either into open conditions or into society uh, who are ready to play the right role, reintegrate back into society, to work, look after their families, um, uh, stay clean of drugs. All of those things go together. But ultimately, our objective is to protect the public, drive down crime and reduce the offending. <laughs> Deanna Davison. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for his statement, but also for his engagement with me over my One Punch Awareness campaign, something on which I'm deeply passionate. And in that campaign, victim support is something that's at the very heart of it, because as we all know, the victims of crime and their families don't stop suffering the moment the crime stops being committed. They can suffer for months, years, and even the lifetime that follows. And that's why the victims of crime need to be at the very heart of our criminal justice system to ensure they receive the support, protection and the reassurance they need. So can my right honourable friend confirm that these proposals will improve victim support and public protection, particularly for victims of the most serious crimes? Well, can, I, can I thank my honourable friend and uh, pay tribute to her tenacious campaign uh, and uh, know how difficult that must be for her as well. But it is very important um, and she brings a huge amount of uh, experience but also personal experience uh, to the Chamber and for the changes we're making. Um, I agree with what she said. We've set out and I've uh, set out for the House the uh, changes we're making for victims in relation to um, the parole decision making process but they are only one element of a much broader strategy and of course we'll be bringing forward a victim's law uh, and again I hope the whole House can rally around that so that victims feel they're uh, front and centre, that they're listened to, that they're taken into account, that they're part of the criminal justice system not an appendix to it. Matt Warman. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Ma Madam Deputy Speaker. When Paul Robson escaped from the North Sea Camp Open Prison in my constituency, the uh, sudden presence of this violent rapist in the community was deeply traumatic, not just for his victims, but for all those people who live in and around the area that the prison occupies. By definition, although the Parole Board do immensely difficult work, the fact that he absconded means that he was in the wrong place. So can my uh, right honourable friend reassure me that what he's announced today makes it far less likely for a, 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 a convict such as Paul Robson to be in those conditions and to place the public at risk in the way that he did when he absconded? 
Oh, kind of thank my honourable friend. I, I can, and I think the changes we've already made that I made in December uh, should give him some reassurance. There is no risk-free approach here, but what we do is we try and create safeguards to mitigate as best we can whilst maintaining a free society. And I also note that uh, under successive governments, uh, conservative governments, I should say, the number of absconds have fallen from 296 in 2009-2010 uh, to um, a 101 in 2020-2021. That's a third of the level. So we've got the security right, uh, but we will continue to make sure we reinforce it. David Johnston. Deputy Speaker, can I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's statement today? Does he agree with me that in those most serious of cases, the public do not expect politicians to throw up their hands and say, well, it was a decision for the parole board. They expect them, as the ones accountable for keeping them safe, to step in and do so because it's their number one job. Thank you. Uh, thank my uh, honourable friend. He's absolutely right. And the frustration is if we delegate from this place uh, or from accountable ministers so much of our decision making, uh, particularly where we're talking about judgment calls, not a purely technocratic or scientific uh, approach, the psychiatry and um, psychology can only take you so far, uh, the public feel we've actually abdicated our responsibility. We're taking back control to provide uh, a safeguard in those high risk cases, and I think that's exactly what the public already expect of us. Paul Bristow. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can, can I congratulate my right honourable friend on his statement? We sometimes forget that the reason, the most overriding reason, important reason we have prisons is not necessarily punishment, but is to keep the public safe. And I know my constituents in Peterborough would want the parole board, parole board to always be um, be risk averse uh, on public protection when it comes to releasing criminals found guilty of serious crimes. So, can my right honourable friend reassure the good people of Peterborough that you understand their concern and that public protection is at the heart of these proposals? Our Chancellor. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I, the, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Public protection must be the overriding priority. Uh, I would also say that I think it's important that open conditions, release on licence, uh, uh, and the credibility of those measures are sustained as well, because the rehabilitative work we do, the encouraging offenders into, into work and getting off drugs, is critically important to reducing reoffending and also protecting the public. But that won't happen. The credibility uh, will be eroded if we don't make sure we've got the safeguards right. Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome the Lord Chancellor's statement? Last week, Two uh, prisoners absconded from uh, Thorncross Prison in my constituency. It brings to the total five uh, so far in, in the first three months of this year. Shane Farrington, as the Lord Chancellor has already mentioned, was one of those who absconded. He was sentenced for killing another prisoner and escaping from custody in 2018. Understandably, people living in Appleton Thorn in my constituency are asking what was he doing in an open prison in Warrington. So can the uh, Lord Chancellor confirm that uh, the changes being announced today will prioritise the safety of people living close to open prisons? And can he assure me that the Government's priority is to cut the number of abscons from open prison like the one in, in Warrington South? Order. Just before the Lord Chancellor answers that question, I appreciate the Honourable Gentleman waiting a long time to ask his question. He made a preamble and he asked two questions. That's not what this is about. Each person has a chance to ask one question. Yeah, yeah. We don't need a preamble. Yeah. The preamble comes from the minister who is making the statement. Yeah. We don't need all of that stated over and over again. And I'm making this point now uh, before we come to the next statement, which I appreciate is going to be controversial. We will have short questions and an, as short as possible answers. I appreciate that the minister has to give a full answer, but we don't need a preamble. It's not a statement. It's not a it's not a speech, it's a question. Lord Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I heed your advice as always. Uh, we've already cut the number of abscons by a third. Of course, the measures that, uh, that I've already introduced, not even announced they introduced in December, will further allow an extra safeguard, which I hope will give his constituents reassurance. I thank the Lord Chancellor for his uh, thorough answers. And uh, we will now move on to the next statement. I will pause to allow people to. Uh, leave the chamber and to come into the chamber and I, I will also, also remind honourable members that after this item of business we have six hours of very important consideration of Lords 
amendments, and that will take us well into the evening. Statement, Secretary of State for Transport. Madam Deputy Speaker, last week I stood at this dispatch box uh, to address the House for the shameful sacking of 800 seafarers by P&O ferries. No British workers should be treated in this way, devoid of dignity and respect. And our maritime workers, who with great dedication and sacrifice supported this country during the pandemic, deserve far better than to be dismissed via a pre-recorded Zoom in favour of cheaper overseas labour. In response, we urge P&O ferries to reconsider. These calls have fallen on deaf ears. Instead, the Chief Executive, Peter Hebblethwaite, in front of Parliament, no less, set out how he deliberately broke the law and, in an act of breathtaking, breathtaking indifference, suggested he would do the same thing again. Madam Deputy Speaker, P&O Ferry's failure to see reason to recognise the public anger and to do the right thing by their staff has left the government with no choice. I am today announcing a package of nine measures that will force them to fundamentally rethink their decision. This will send a clear message to the maritime industry who will not allow this to happen again. That where new laws are needed, we will create them. Where legal loopholes are cynically exploited, we will close them. And where employment rights are too weak, we will strengthen them. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me start with enforcement action we're taking. Far too, may, too, too many irregularities exist between those who work at sea and those who work on the land. Even where workers have rights, they're not always enforced. So the first measure I can announce is that HMRC will be dedicating significant resource to check that all UK ferry operators are compliant with the national minimum wage. No ifs, no buts. Second, I've asked the Maritime Coast Guard Agency to review their enforcement policies, checking that they are fit for purpose both now and in the future. The House will recall that the MCA is already at my request carrying out inspections of P&O ferries. And so far, two ships, the European Causeway and the Pride of Kent, have been detained after failing safety inspections. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will not compromise the safety of any vessel, and P&O will not be able to rush new crews through training and expect those ships to sail. This work is ongoing. Madam Deputy Speaker, third, we'll take action to prevent employers who have not made reasonable efforts to reach agreement through consultation from using fire and rehire tactics. A new statutory code will allow a court, an employment tribunal, or an employment tribunal to take the manner of dismissal into account, and if an employer fails to comply with the code, impose a 25% uplift to a worker's compensation. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have made no secret of my view that P&O Ferry's boss, Peter Hebblethwaite, should resign. He set, out, he set out to break the law and boasted about it to this Parliament. So I have written to the CEO of the Insolvency Service, conveying my firm belief that Peter Hebblethwaite is unfit to lead a British company. And I've asked them to consider his disqualification. The Insolvency Service has the legal powers to pursue complaints where a company has engaged in, and I quote, so-called sharp practice. Surely the whole House agrees that nothing could be sharper than dismissing 800 staff and deliberately breaking the law whilst doing so. It is, of course, for the Insolvency Service to decide what happens next, but in taking this step, I want to ensure the outrageous behaviour is challenged. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is a hard truth that those working at sea do not enjoy the same benefits as those working on land, which brings me to my fifth element of the package today, a renewed focus on the training and welfare elements of flagship maritime strategy. We are already investing £30 million through the Maritime Training Fund to grow our seafarer population, but I will go further, pursuing worldwide agreements at the International Labour Organisation where we'll push for a common set of principles to support maritime workers, uh, including an international minimum wage, a global framework for maritime training and skills, and tools to support seafarer mental health. 
Sixth, we know that P&O ferries exploited a loophole. They flagged their vessels in Cyprus to escape UK laws. So we will take action on this too. And we therefore decided that from next week, we'll reform tonnage tax to come into effect, meaning that maritime businesses set up in the UK uh, will have unnecessary red tape removed, will have provisions so they no long, which are no longer required uh, from the EU removed, and by doing so will increase the attractiveness of UK flagging and bring more ships under our control and thereby protect the welfare of seafarers. Madam Deputy Speaker, much of maritime law is uh, governed by international laws, obligations and treaties. And this means that we cannot hope to solve the problems alone. So the seventh plank of our package today is to engage with international partners. Now, this week I've already contacted my counterparts in France, Denmark, the Netherlands, Ireland and Germany to discuss how maritime workers on direct routes between our countries should receive a minimum wage. I'm delighted to say the response has already been very, very positive, particularly with my French counterpart, the Minister for Transport. So we'll now work quickly with these counterparts to explore the creation of minimum wage corridors between our nations. As we ask, we'll also be asking unions and operators to agree common levels of safer, of seafarer protection on these routes as well. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've set out how we'll step up enforcement, how we'll support the workforce in the long term, how we'll get more vessels flagged under the British flag, how we're working with international partners to create minimum wage corridors. But I know that this House is expecting legislative changes too. Now, we had originally come to the Chamber and expected to say today that we'd announce changes under the national minimum wage. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, after seeking expert maritime legal advice, it's become clear that this just would not be possible. The issue is this. Maritime law is governed by international conventions that would too easily have been overridden by domestic laws, by domestic changes, would too easily overwrite them. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will not let that stop us. Seafarers deserve the same wage certainty as onshore workers, safe in the knowledge that, at a moment's notice, they won't be undercut by cheaper overseas labour. So today, we are providing that certainty. I can announce to the House our eighth measure, our intention to give British ports new statutory powers to refuse access to regular ferry services which do not pay their crew the national minimum wage. Yeah. We'll achieve this through primary legislation to amend the Harbours Act 1964, and it means that if companies like P&O Ferries want to dock in ports such as Dover and Hull and Liverpool, they'll have no choice but to comply with this legislation. Crucially, it means that P&O Ferries can derive no benefit from the action that they have disgracefully taken. They have fired their workers to replace them with those who are paid the minimum wage, and as a result of this measure, that cynical attempt will fail. So my message to P&O Ferries is this. The game is up. Rehire those who want to return and pay your workers, all of your workers, a decent wage. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government wants to bring this legislation forward as quickly as possible. It's important to get it right. We're legally bound to consult with the sector on any changes. And unlike P&O, we take that consultation seriously. So, legislative changes will not be possible overnight, but to that end, I can announce the ninth and final measure we'll be taking. Today, I'll be writing to all ports in the UK, explaining our intention to bring legislation as quickly as possible, but in the meantime, instructing them not to wait. Now, I want to see British ports refusing access to ferry companies who don't pay a fair wage as soon as practical. And this will have the full backing of the government, and I've instructed the Maritime Coast Guard Agency to get behind this action too, and they've indicated that they will. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, this issue has united the whole House, indeed the whole country, in anger at those responsible and in sympathy for those affected. Now, 
We are proudly pro-business government, but we will never support those that treat workers with the callousness and disrespect that we have seen. British workers aren't expendable. They are the backbone of this country. And this robust package of measures announced today will give our maritime workers the rights they deserve whilst, observing, uh, whilst destroying the supposed gains P&O ferries hoped to obtain. They will send a clear message that if you are using British waters and British ports to ply your trade, then you must accept British laws. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Louise Hague. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement and for the briefing he gave uh, me on these measures last week. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know the whole House agrees that the action taken by P&O Ferries was beneath contempt. A sense of fair play and decency runs deep in this country. It's part of who we are. So the sight of a rogue employer who has made a mockery of our rule of law, trashed the reputation of a great British brand and upended the lives of 800 families, saying he would do it all again, offends people deeply. The test, therefore, for this government in the eyes of the country is simple. Do not let them get away with it, because for too long they have. The warning sirens have been sounding for years. P&O ferries have been exploiting workers in plain sight. In this House, the government was told repeatedly of seafarers on destitution wages, some earning just £1.74 an hour. My honourable friend, the member for Hull East, warned, if the government fail to act, how long will it be before we see the same thing happen on other critical shipping lanes? The gate was left wide open and P&O ferries have sailed straight through it. So the steps announced by the government to insist on the bare minimum cannot come a moment too soon. It is a move we warmly welcome and which has our wholehearted support. But can the Secretary of State confirm that the national minimum wage will apply on the entirety of all UK international routes through the harbour legislation he's outlined, not just in British waters, as P&O seemed to suggest yesterday. And I very much welcome the Secretary of State's action to instruct the Insolvency Service to consider the CEO disqualification. When will the Insolvency Service respond so the Business Secretary can seek an order for his disqualification before the court? However, Madam Deputy Speaker, the letter yesterday from P&O showed in black and white that regardless of this proposed legislation, they still intend to carry out their outrageous plan. To sack 800 workers, to trample over the laws of this country, to take an axe to the pay and conditions of their replacements and force through a 60% 60, 60 pay cut even with this legislation in place. This is, as the Joint Select Committees were told last week, fire and rehire on steroids. And p and ferries must not get away with it. That is why the government's reluctance to use every tool at its disposal to force them to change course is bewildering. No prosecution has been taken, despite the Prime Minister's announcement last week, and the deadline to act to protect these workers is tomorrow. And the Chancellor confirmed yesterday to my honourable friend for Hull West that the review into the relationship with DP World has already concluded. They will keep every single taxpayer-funded contract. So even with these very welcome steps today, the government still risks giving the green light to P&O and other exploitative employers. So will the Secretary of State now guarantee he will prosecute, disqualify the directors and suspend their lucrative contracts? And if P&O continue to proceed with this unlawful action and risk safety, isn't it time to suspend their licence to operate? Mm. Will he introduce powers to allow the government to step in and stop any such illegal behaviour in the future and force employers back to the negotiating table? And will he amend the Trade Union Act so employees can seek unlimited punitive damages against yeah. such unlawful action yeah. in the future? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, p and ferries have written the blueprint for bad business the world over. They must know there will be consequences, because this scandal extends well beyond p and It is the consequence of a decade in which the axe has been taken to workers' rights. Yeah, yeah. The balance tipped far away from working people. Fire and rehire has become commonplace. 
and millions of people are thinking, will I be next? The measures announced today uh, by the business minister, I'm afraid, shows the government still doesn't get it. It may mean extra compensation, but only after going through a tribunal process that is beset with delays and backlogs, and this is a price bad bosses have already shown they are prepared to pay. So if ministers mean what they say, if this is truly going to be a line in the sand, they will bring forward an emergency employment bill straight after recess. No more half measures, no more excuses, ban, fire and rehire for good. They will guarantee that not a penny of public money is handed out to companies that disregard workers' rights. And they will work with RMT and Nautilus to pursue a binding agreement on pay and conditions to end the race to the bottom that P&O are determined to lead. Madam Deputy Speaker, we will work constructively with the government on the measures announced today. But 13 days on from this scandalous act, key ship shipping routes are still suspended. 800 workers are still without their jobs. Those responsible have no regrets and time is almost out. The stakes could not be higher. To reverse this scandalous act, the action of ministers must now match their words. Yeah. 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 Speaker, I, I want to actually uh, thank the Honourable Lady because actually throughout this uh, crisis she has been very proactive in uh, getting in contact, uh, providing uh, additional ideas and, and thoughts, uh, many of which have actually been uh, entered into the package um, today, and it's been, broadly speaking, uh, pretty uh, constructive, uh, along with a number of other members from across the House. Um, she asked a number of specific questions. I'm going to answer them very quickly. Uh, the, she asked about the extent of the intention here. It is for routes which uh, ply the trade between Britain and our continental uh, neighbours, which is why I mentioned the individuals that I've contacted uh, in those foreign governments. Uh, she asked about the speed of the insolvency service. They're, of course, independent, so we don't have a direct control over that. I very much hope that they will act appropriately quickly. She asked about uh, court action and why the government hasn't taken any. It's because the government is not in the position to take the court action. That's for the unions and for the uh, workers, and we understand the limitations of that, which is why I've described some of the items here. She asks about P&O contracts. We have looked and haven't identified any in the spirit of cooperation uh, to all members of the House, and her in particular, if anyone is aware of uh, any contracts which we've yet to uncover. Uh, we haven't found any so far. The only two were historic during coronavirus. Um, she mentions uh, how this might be indicative of a wider uh, issue of perhaps this government's approach towards uh, employees. Uh, I just want to gently mention that it was this government in 2020 that introduced the national minimum wage extended to seafarers on domestic uh, routes. We did that, not any other government, uh, and that it was indeed in 2005, 2005 when Irish ferries introduced this low-cost yep. approach, which has forced P&O's hand, according to P&O. 2005, I seem to recall... This chap called Tony Blair used to stand at this dispatch box. Hugh Merriman. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Um, can I not just welcome these package of measures, but also thank, and I hope it will be on behalf of the whole House, the Secretary of State for the leadership that he has shown. We have real urgency now in this, and that's what we asked for, and that's what we've got. I thank him for that. Can I ask him, with regards to consultation rights, P&O Ferris came before our committee last Thursday and said that they were basically buying out those rights from the workers because they could. Would he consider in the longer term some power of the insolvency service to have some injunctive relief to stop the actions of P&O Ferries? They've effectively audited our legislative book and found it wanting. Yes, it's certainly something we're considering. I want to thank uh, my humble friend for his work, his select committee and the other one who uh, brought the P&O boss in here. Uh, I think it astounded, astonished the House, but also the whole country uh, to hear that testimony has directly led to the uh, package that we have today. And item number six uh, goes some way to uh, uh, addressing his specific point as well. Gavin Newlands. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Dep Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the Secretary of State for uh, advanced sight of his statement? And can I, I generally welcome uh, uh, the action that he has outlined uh, today? The strength of his words must, however, be followed by the, the strength and urgency of his actions. There are areas uh, where I hope you can be persuaded to go further, but um, I am pleased that those who perpetrated these uh, shameful actions against penal workers are being held to account and shown the consequences of their law breaking. And as I've said to uh, a few people in this, this House, uh, the delay to national minimum wage measures due to international maritime labour laws was something I, I feared may happen. 
Uh, I commend the Secretary for trying to find a workaround, but perhaps you could give us some more detail on that, and perhaps if we will, in the meantime, indemnify ports uh, with any action they may take against, against ferry operators. Uh, the movement on fire and rehire is, is welcome, particularly given the work I and many members across the House have, have done in recent years. However, uh, and, but this is where I depart from the, the praise um, for the Minister, because, as I said to, to the Minister sitting beside him, I have had many British Airways workers contact me um, in the last um, few days asking where, where this progressive uh, nay so socialist uh, Transport Secretary was when British Airways workers, British Airways workers were being threatened with uh, fire and rehire. And if I just reference his statement, he says, We will take action to prevent employers who have not made reasonable efforts to reach agreement through consultation from using fire and rehire tactics. And I would say to him, uh, that no threat of fire and rehire, whether followed by consultation or not, is reasonable. It must end, and it must end now. Uh, the chairs of the Transport and Bay... Uh, sorry, I, I, I've skipped on too far, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, where I am disappointed is that in the tools available to tribunals and courts to enforce a new code, a 25 per cent uplift in compensation is, as p and have demonstrated, merely a cost to be factored in for unscrupulous employers with deep pockets and does not hit employers who simply do not pay their tribunal mandated compensation. So can we instead see real teeth for this measure to allow tribunals to deploy the full range of outcomes towards employers, including recommending reinstatement, uh, where that is possible. Um, that would be a major deterrent to others considering fire and rehire. The chairs of the Transport and Base Select Committees wrote jointly to the Secretary earlier this week. Amongst other things, they called for the prosecution of PNO, the removal of its licence to operate in the UK, and the review into DP World's involvement in the Freeports project. We have heard, um, sadly, that the DP World review um, has been complete. But what consideration is he giving to the remaining conclusions of the chairs? And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I welcome the beefed-up role for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency in enforcing some of these new measures. However, the last financial year saw the MCA receive a real terms cut in central government funding. So will he make extra funds available to the MCA so that he's, uh, what he's announced today can actually, actually happen on the ground, rather than being great in principle but undeliverable in practice? Briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, I did mention that I would be working with the International Labour Organisation. I will also be working with the International Maritime Organisation, who are headquartered globally, of course, in uh, London, on making this a global uh, move. Uh, I want to uh, refer him to uh, why some of what he said would not apply, because once we have changed the Harbours Act uh, 1964, it would outlaw the ability of uh, needing to end up going to uh, a tribunal and the 25 per cent uplift uh, and the rest of it. Uh, I think I'll leave it there for brevity. Natalie Elphick. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I warmly welcome the strong package of measures announced today. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the behaviour of the directors of PO is disgraceful and they must be held to account? That the Dover Calais route must be operated to the highest safety standards, decent paying conditions and on a level playing field? And will he continue to work with me, as he has done since this disgraceful act occurred, to do everything possible to support the Dover Calais Sea Corridor and the Dover community? Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to thank my uh, honourable friend for her incredible input into this right in Dover there. Uh, at the front line of uh, any impacts when ferries uh, are not running. Her contribution and assistance, her guidance have been absolutely invaluable. I will absolutely uh, step up to the, her asks on this. Uh, and in particular, I just want to stress, I think probably on behalf of the whole House, uh, in this House we find it unacceptable that somebody would deliberately and knowingly and wantingly uh, go out of their way uh, to uh, break the law in sacking these uh, staff. We will not take that line down. The law will be changed. And then Frey, P and O ferries, although as of last night didn't realise it, will have to U-turn. Um, Bradley, Brad, Bradshaw, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's don't worry, Madam Davies. It's, it's, it's a common and embarrassing mistake for the other one. Um, <laughs> Um, could he explain in a bit more detail why he thinks he doesn't have the powers to seek an injunction to prevent uh, this company uh, behaving deliberately, disgracefully, and as he just described, illegally? I am grateful to the hon honourable gentleman. Look, look I have taken a lot of legal advice this uh, last uh, ten days or two weeks, um, and we simply have not found the power to exist in the form that he describes. And maritime law is complex. It is also international 
uh, in nature. Uh, and so we have uh, looked through every possible uh, solution, and the Harbour Act 1964 is the way uh, to deliver this. But in the meantime, uh, to have the Maritime Coast Guard Agency making sure that we can bring these benefits much sooner than the laws pass through this place. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is clear that Peter Hepplethwaite has no intention of acting with honour, but I do hope that this package of measures will at least give him pause for thought. I hear the calls uh, for further action against the parent company, DP World. I would just gently point out to those saying that, that that is not without its consequences. As home to London Gateway in my constituency, there are hundreds of people employed there as well. So I want them to act cautiously. However, I do call upon Deep A World, the parent company, to look closely at the actions of Peter Hepplethwaite, because he is damaging their reputation, he is damaging their relationship with the government, and he's damaging their relationship with me. Get him to do the right thing. Madam Deputy Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right about the reputation of P- P- P&O ferries being ripped to shreds in 14 days in a way that I can't uh, think of any other company in corporate uh, history. It's very important that their owners understand they are very, very welcome in this country to invest and to create employment. But we take employment law seriously, and they need to uh, understand that, and they need to deal with this P&O situation. Otherwise, that will not be smooth. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome the Secretary of State's statement today. I think this is one of the most substantial and significant statements I have heard as almost 21 years as a member in the House who has taken a close interest in the matters of the merchant marine. Uh, and I hope that this is the start of a very different practice than that that we have seen in recent decades. One of the problems that we have had over the years is that when a successive governments were introducing the tonnage tax and refining it, there was a link to training, but not enough link then to post-training employment. That is the sort of thing that's got to change. Protection has got to be given not just to officers, but to ratings. So when he's constructing the next uh, round of the tonnage tax, will he listen first to the unions representing the ratings and the officers, and not just the shipping companies? Well, needless to say, I'm very grateful for the honourable gentleman's uh, comments on this statement. Uh, And it is a serious attempt to sort out something which internationally uh, has not been satisfactory for a very long time because of the global nature of uh, shipping. He's absolutely right to zero in on the tonnage tax. As he knows from, I think it's the 4th of April, there will be an opening for the tonnage tax, the first time in many years. Uh, And if we can get this right, we can not only, uh, obviously, uh, use the tonnage tax to improve the industry, but actually to drive the right kind of behaviour and with ships, more ships flagged under the British uh, flag lead uh, as we do as a maritime nation, not only with the IMO here, but using the tonnage tax to pull those ships along. Damien Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate my right honourable friend on the package of measures he's announced and I, I very much hope they're effective. One of the immediate effects of, of PO's disgraceful action has been massively to reduce the capacity of freight to go across the Channel, yeah. and that has had the predictable knock on effects of emergency measures needed uh, on the Kent motorway network, causing disturbance and, and some misery to my constituents and others across Kent. Uh, as well as these measures, does the Department have any proposals to mitigate? the problems uh, with cross-channel freight and therefore therefore to uh, mitigate the effects on the M20 and other roads in Kent as well. I want to apologise to my right honourable gentleman and to other Kent MPs because I appreciate that this situation by P&O has caused considerable um, disruption. We have uh, put the movable barrier out in place. I spoke to the uh, lead of the Kent Resilience Forum uh, yesterday, uh, and they have been reporting to me on its uh, level of usage, because I do not just want it to be there for, for no reason. It is being uh, regularly uh, used. Uh, it is actually a, a sort of a benefit that we have got from um, having put in that movable barrier that it no longer takes weeks to deploy and, and take away. I am very cognizant of the disturbance this creates for honourable members uh, in the Kent uh, area, and I will ensure that we meet regularly with, uh, with him and other members uh, to provide updates on uh, what we expect to happen next. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the statement made by the Minister today, and in particular his reference to international seafarers. I recognise he used the word minimum wage conditions on ferries, 
but he then went on to talk about international seafarers who often face disgraceful, almost slave-like conditions of work on international transport. So will he commit to work with the International Transport Federation of Transport Trade Unions as well as the ILO on trying to get rid of this scandal on a global scale, which obviously Britain can only play one part in, but can be a very big influence on changing the whole mood internationally on this? Uh, well, the right honourable gentleman is uh, right to point out that this is an international issue. Uh, I, it's worth saying that during the pandemic, uh, we got a UN resolution uh, through to recognise seafarers uh, as key workers. We repatriated 22,000 uh, seafarers. I sent the MCA in to raid a ship that was in Tilbury Docks that I suspected had international uh, seafarers being held essentially against their will at work, uh, which was uh, successful in their prosecutions. Uh, and of course, uh, we've gone further uh, today with measures that I've outlined, uh, which I hope uh, he'll approve of, considering it includes working with the International Labour Organisation. Damien Collins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Secretary of State's robust statement in response to the appalling behaviour of PNO and also the work that he and his department are doing with the Kent Resilience Forum to make sure we keep motorway traffic moving uh, through the county. But does he agree with me, it is important that the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency continues to be robust and does not allow crews, the, the ships that are poorly crewed with not qualified uh, crew members on board, from crossing the world's busiest shipping lane? My honourable friends, absolutely right. The, the second item that I uh, announce, which uh, backs up what's already been happening with the MCA, looking at those ships very carefully, will continue. We will not compromise safety in the sea lanes. We've seen what happens before when uh, compromises are, are made, and we do not want to see that repeated. Sammy Wilson. Can I also welcome the work which the Minister has done on this important issue and the urgency with which he has acted? I doubt very much, however, if when he writes to P&O, they are going to uh, abide by his instruction not to allow ships to, f to dock in either Larne or Cairn Ryan, where they own the port, they own the boats, and they are acting illegally by giving uh, minimum, less, less than minimum wage to workers. But that monopoly issue is an important one for Northern Ireland, because the ships, one of the ships is impounded at present. There is an absence of service. The port re represents a strategic asset for Northern Ireland because nearly 50 per cent of our trade comes through it. Businesses which operate in that port are not getting any revenue, workers are not getting any work, and Northern Ireland is finding its supply issues are being affected. What action can he take with this company to uh, try and restore the situation? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Honourable Gentleman raises a lot of very important points, and uh, as he rightly points out, uh, one of the ships has already been detained in Northern Ireland. Um, Stena have been doing a great job to fill in some of the uh, gap. I'm going to ask uh, other uh, companies to assist where possible. And I'm also, if he uh, doesn't mind, going to ask him to meet again, I know he has already, uh, with my Honourable Friend, the Maritime Minister, because these specific issues relating to Northern Ireland, I think, will need a lot of care and attention over the coming days. Virginia Crosby. Madam Deputy Speaker, whilst I welcome the new measures my right honourable friend has brought to the House, what reassurance can he give that these measures will support companies like Stena Line to grow jobs, particularly local jobs and local labour, and that this news is good for the UK seafarers and good for the UK flag? Well, I thank my honourable friend. Um, look, I think the simple fact is that what this package will do is finally ensure that the whole of the seafaring community, uh, when it comes to uh, these channel crossings, for example, are on a level playing field or a level C. Uh, it means that there won't be advantage to Irish ferries running a cut price route or now P&O ferries trying to do the same. So for Stenner and uh, D D F D uh, DS and others, uh, this will ensure that they can all operate and compete from a fair platform. Bill Esterson. The Secretary of State says that P&O should reinstate every worker on their original terms and conditions. I completely agree with him about that, but he needs to take every action available to him to support the group of workers who have just been sacked. What he's announced today is very largely about the future. So will he suspend or cancel P&O and DP World contracts, including the lucrative Freeport contracts, because that's how he'll show to DP World and P&O that the government really is serious and give the greatest possible chance of putting pressure on them that will lead to the reinstatement of those workers. 
Uh, well, I should point out, of course, that the, the workers involved here, many of whom I've been speaking to, uh, frankly don't really want to go back and work for uh, P&O Ferries in many cases and or have already accepted jobs um, elsewhere. I think they'll be looking for a change in that company before they rush back there. Uh, the uh, P&O uh, contracts, we haven't found any that exist. He refers to the DP World uh, issue. I have seen, uh, and I think it's the point my honourable friend was making uh, previously, uh, figures quoted for the amount of money in a contract for them. That's actually money that goes to the local authority. Uh, by and large, uh, and it's for them to then uh, set out how the, uh, the free port uh, operates. But uh, be in no doubt, we will be keeping a very, very close eye, eye on this and increasing the pressure to make sure that the right thing happens with PO. Alex Sharples. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I, I warmly welcome my wonderful friend's um, statement today. Um, he, he, he's clarified a lot of technical points. I think it will be important to analyse um, how the cruise ship industry accesses um, British waters and also making sure that the critical infrastructure of freight transport um, isn't allowed to be held hostage again, which is really what PO tried to do for its own terms. But can I just um, ask my wonderful friend just on this point, in terms of ensuring that the seafarers are being paid at least minimum wage in our waters. How is that technically going to be done if they're not registered through HMRC in this country? Mr. Speaker, I, I, should, I, I should just point out once again um, that P&O cruises are not in any way, shape or form related to what's happened here with P&O ferries who are uh, very much the people who are in the dock. Uh, and uh, so we will, uh, with the ferries, ensure that HMRC uh, and uh, the work of the ports themselves is where that policing takes place. Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Chief Speaker. Awards for compensation in employment tribunals are notoriously low, with average awards for unfair dismissal at just £10,800. The Minister has announced an uplift of 25%, but an extra £2,700 is not going to deter unscrupulous employers like P&O. My honourable friend, the Shadow Transport Secretary, has called for unlimited punitive damages in circumstances like these. Will the Minister back those calls? Yeah. Well, I think actually the, the simple answer to this in this case, we want to stop this from ever even getting that far, and we'll do that by forcing them to pay the minimum wage in the first place. What we're not against, I should just clarify, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the idea that sometimes, unfortunately, redundancies do occur. We know that, we've seen it with the pandemic, and we're very pleased that after the pandemic, unemployment is as low or lower than it was uh, before. But we understand business has to change. What is unacceptable is deliberately setting out to break the law when it comes to consultations, and that is the thing that we are focusing on. Uh, and uh, these nine measures will ensure we don't get there in the first place, and then there are more punitive measures in place. Laura Farris. Madam Deputy Speaker, I congratulate the Secretary of State on his excellent work and particularly the very creative and robust approach he's taken to closing the national minimum wage loophole, which makes this whole thing a complete waste of money for P&O. Can I press him a little further on what he was saying about future injunctive relief? Would he consider uh, in, in enlarging the powers of the High Court to order a, a mandatory 90-day consultation where there has been no consultation, because it was apparent from Hebblethwaite's appearance before the Select Committee that he saw it as a tick-box exercise, rather than a meaningful engagement with the unions to try and minimise redundancies, mitigate the consequences, which can actually and often does work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my honourable friend makes an excellent um, point, and uh, I, ju I just also want to place on record, Madam Deputy Speaker, that she, as a former employment, lo employment law lawyer, has been incredibly helpful throughout this process, yeah. as have many others in this House, and I see the member for Hull East is uh, in his place as well, somebody else who has been extraordinarily helpful. Yeah. Uh, and the answer to her question is yes, uh, I will work with my colleagues over uh, at Bayes uh, to look at how we can uh, make further improvements to uh, those injunctive procedures. Um, so I Thank you for her work, and yes is the answer. Andrew Gwynne. Uh, thank you. And can I also uh, welcome the Transport Secretary's statement today and also thank him for the seriousness that he's given uh, this issue because it has been appalling on those PO ferry workers. Uh, he talks about amending the uh, Harbours Act 1964, which I wholeheartedly welcome, and he's urged ports to do that now irrespective of the legislation not yet being changed. As futile as legal action may be from P&O ferries, what assurances is he giving to British ports to do the right thing, notwithstanding it not being uh, the law yet? 
Uh, I think it may, may be helpful to the Honourable Gentleman and the whole House if I place the letters uh, that will go out immediately with this statement uh, to the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, where I request them to carry out this action, and indeed a response which I believe is already forthcoming. Saki Barty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Like many of my colleagues on this side of the House, I've often advocated for business being a force for good. And that means celebrating businesses that are a positive uh, contributor to society, but it also means calling out bad actors like PO who have treated their workers so callously. Does, the, my, does my right honourable friend agree with me that this plan today now sends a clear signal to any business thinking of going down this route that the government will penalise any company which treats workers as disposable as PO did? Yes. Dan Carden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Secretary of State's statement and his action plan, uh, but it seems to me if the only legislative changes are to give new statutory powers to ports, then this issue of fire and rehire is not going to go away. So can I ask the Secretary of State what conversations has he had with the Business Secretary uh, for legislation so that the outrage that there is, rightly, in this chamber isn't brought back here again next month and the month after and the month after. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think what really set this case uh, apart was the way that the uh, boss of PO brazenly uh, uh, wanted to break the law, admits to breaking the law, says he'll do it again, uh, and so the changes in this case to the Harbour Act 1964 will deal with that. But in addition, uh, he's, uh, he asked what conversations I've been having with the Bay Secretary of State. Uh, very fulsome is the answer, and we've been looking uh, across the piece at uh, how employment law uh, operates, and we'll continue to do so, uh, notwithstanding the fact we want there to be flexibilities in employment law. That's one of the things that leads to this country having consistently lower unemployment than the rest of the EU, for example. Barry Gardner. I welcome the fact that the Secretary of State is considering injunctive procedures where consultation has been ignored and not respected uh, by the employer. Uh, just a shame that his party failed to vote for it in October. Will the Secretary of State uh, say if the statutory code he is introducing will create any new criminal offence? If so, what is it? Who can enforce it? What is the penalty? Or does it, like previous codes of conduct, simply issue a set of recommendations that bad companies can ignore? Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, so I, I should say to the Honourable Gentleman that the detail on that was actually set out by the Business Minister yesterday uh, in this uh, House, uh, and I'll make sure that he gets a full note detailing the answers to his question. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the statement from the Secretary of State, but there is a, a reality here that PO could adjust it, its measures and then continue to operate, and of course, operate with different staff, 800 staff losing their jobs. So, what consideration has the Secretary of State given to a tenth option for an operator of last resort, such as operate on the, the rail industry, so that he could immediately take those? Um, those routes back into public ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the Honourable Lady, be interested here, I have considered an operator of last resort uh, model. Uh, when I look at what happens at sea, it's somewhat different to what happens on the railways uh, by very nature of the fact there's open sea but specific lines of, of rail uh, in existence. And in this case, of course, we've got uh, the beauty of competition. So we've got Stena, we've got DFDS, we've got some others uh, in that market, and they are plugging uh, the gap so that we're uh, from a capacity point of view at this time, uh, OK. And the grand finale, <laughs> Carl Turner. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you for accommodating me. I want to thank the Secretary of State. This campaign has not just gone on for the 12 years that I've been in this House. This campaign has existed since the 1966 Siemens strike. So I congratulate the uh, honourable gen right honourable gentleman and his uh, colleague the minister for getting through all of the hurdles that must have been appearing in front of them and I, work, I want to work with my shadow secretary to ensure that what he proposes will, ha will actually work to ensure that the minimum wage applies but my concern is this these companies employ terribly bad practice I fear they'll find other ways to exploit seafarers. Safety is my big concern. So if conditions change, 
if rotors change, if seafarers are required to work five months on, for example, and a month off, we, we, we're not going to be very far from disasters like the Herald of Free Enterprise, where passengers lost their lives due to crew fatigue. Can he assure the House that he's looking at ensuring that can't happen in this case? Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I uh, prefaced, I'm hugely grateful uh, to the Honourable Gentleman. He's provided contacts, knowledge, expertise, experience through the last uh, week and a half as we've been discussing um, this issue, and I'm incredibly grateful uh, for his uh, historic knowledge of the industry as well. I can also assure him uh, that that's precisely what we're doing. In my uh, comments, uh, I said uh, that we'll be pursuing worldwide agreements with the International Labour Organization. We'll also push for a common set of principles to support maritime workers, including on international minimum wage, global framework for maritime training and skills, and tools to support seafarer mental health. I know these are issues that he has been fighting for for a very long time, and his time is Thank you. I thank the Secretary of State for answering so many questions and, and so quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let us right. proceed. Point of, order, oh, point of order, Jill Furness. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. On a point of order, my constituent Anton is Ukrainian and his sister and two month old niece have made a perilous journey from Mariupol to Dnipro to try and escape the ongoing conflict. Anton is now desperate to bring them to the UK as soon as possible and he has ample accommodation for them. He has applied for a Ukraine family scheme visa for each of them. However, as his baby niece does not yet have a passport of her own, the Home Office is demanding they attend a visa appointment for biometric photos to be taken of her. This requirement strikes me as absurd. Mm. I have written to ministers, but I am concerned that the upcoming recess mean, may mean that it will not be addressed with the urgency it requires. I therefore ask for your guidance, Madam Deputy Speaker, on what steps I can take before we rise tomorrow to ensure ministers remove this hurdle urgently. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for her point of order. As she knows, it is not a point of order and it is not for the Chair to give the answer, but I appreciate that she is using the opportunity of a point of order to raise a matter which she does not otherwise have the opportunity to raise. Um, the first thing I say to her is that I am sure the Treasury bench has heard her question, but I hope that I can be a bit more helpful to her <coughs> than that, <Yes>. because <coughs> excuse me, I understand the <coughs> the need for urgency. Um, I have asked similar questions as a constituency MP and found that um, ministers are, excuse me, we have a slight crisis here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Hay fever isn't meant to extend to the chair. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Um, I have discovered that the ministers who are dealing with this are very open to giving immediate and thorough answers if they are asked in the right way. I know that they are holding surgeries for all members of parliament. I know that their special advisers have made themselves available and that the ministers in question uh, want to answer questions like the honourable lady's questions immediately. There is I have discovered no intention to delay because the sort of case that the Honourable Lady has described is one that we all have every sympathy with and there are ways round it. Um, so I am sure that the Honourable Lady will get an answer and very quickly um, if she approaches the Minister and Special Advisers directly. Um, it is not really for me to give that advice but if she is uh, if she's really stuck come and see me in my office later and I'll find a way to get that question through to her because we don't want that baby to suffer and there are ways of dealing with this. Point of order, Clive Lewis. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a very similar uh, issue. I wanted to seek your guidance as to how I may raise the plight of refugees currently languishing on the Ukrainian-Polish border near Medica and beyond. Dave Powles, the editor of my local newspaper, The Norwich Evening News, is on the ground there and has stated that the Government Homes for Ukraine scheme is failing by every metric possible. Despite hundreds of people across Norwich and Norfolk volunteering to take refugees into their own homes, a lack of coordination, communication, overcomplication, 
and technical delays means that whilst 80 families have been matched, not one has been accepted into the UK. So home office support on the ground is also non-existent. And what support there is is coming from small charities and individuals struggling with the numbers they're dealing with. So can you advise me, Madam Deputy Speaker, as to how I may bring this tragic situation to the government's attention? Well, I appreciate the honourable gentleman's point of order, and I think I have just given him the answer. I, I am sure that ministers are not trying to delay. They are trying to give members as much information and as much advice as possible and as soon as possible, and that there will be a way in which the honourable gentleman can get that ad advice. Um, I don't want to keep offering myself as a conduit, but I, I rather think that the Treasury bench have, um, have, have, have heard the honourable gentleman's point and that it will be treated with sympathy. With sympathy. Thank you. So, okay. We now come to the 10-minute rule motion. I call Mr Steve Bryan. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to make provision for the purposes of increasing uptake of NHS breast screening programme appointments, including groups currently less likely to take up such appointments, to extend eligibility to that programme to persons at an increased risk of breast cancer because of their family history and for connected purposes. Last weekend saw, of course, Mothering Sunday. Um, for many of our constituents, that meant a time to catch up with mum maybe have lunch, maybe go for a walk or buy some flowers. My little ones did that for my wife. For some, however, Sunday was not a day for lunch or a walk or a catch-up. There were flowers, but they were dropped off at the churchyard or the crematorium as they are every year. And that, Madam Deputy Speaker, included me, as it has done for the past 19 years. I was in my late 20s, away on my stag do in Wales, when I got a phone call very early in the morning to say I needed to get home. My mother was in hospital by that point with only one possible outcome and she passed away a few days later, five weeks before Susie and I got married. She was just 52 years old. Now they say events and life before we enter this place shape how we approach some of our time here, and they're right. Colleagues here and constituents in Winchester and Charles Ford know this is an issue I'm passionate about, and now they know why. For the first five years as an MP, I co-chaired the all-party breast cancer group, and then in 2017 it was the privilege of my life to serve as the cancer minister. And we said then, as now, that for cancer, an early diagnosis can be game-changing. Cancer's magic key, as it's often been put. And breast cancer is an incredibly treatable cancer if detected early. 98% of women who have the disease detected at stage one survive for at least five years after their diagnosis, and many of them go on to lead full lives. And it's true that we've made huge progress on tackling cancer. Indeed, survival